Okay. Welcome to uh, Council for April the 14th of 2020. Um, I guess we're heading into our second month of this. Uh, folks, I'm pleased that this is our third Council meeting in this uh, format. And once again, I want to thank those who uh, made it uh, possible. I just want to remind, we, I think we are on Eastlink, so when uh, this will show up on Eastlink, you'll get to see Mancini's ear uh, very closely. There we are. Um, just want to remind everybody to keep your camera on to the councillors and uh, mute when you're not speaking and that way it'll go a lot better. Um, and use the chat device um, just to indicate that you would like to speak. All right, folks, uh, I'll call the meeting to order. I'm going to introduce once again each councillor to make sure that we have them and the camera and audio are working. So as I introduce you, please take yourself off audio. Uh, Phil has asked that we take five or ten seconds to make sure that we get to each person. So um, I'll, you can say a word if you'd like to, anybody you'd like to. So we'll begin with uh, Councillor Stretch in District 1. Councillor Stretch, how are you today? How was Easter? I'm fine, uh, Your Worship. Uh, Easter was fine, uh, uh, albeit uh, separated. Uh, we were able to participate uh, uh, by virtual uh, dinner. And uh, the boys all reminded me that my signal was the worst of anybody's. But uh, here in District 1, Waverly, Fall River, Muscadabit Valley, uh, pleased to be here and uh, uh, good to see your face and uh, looking forward to seeing my colleagues and all the best to the public out there listening, watching. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Councillor Hensby, District 2. Hello. Here we are. On. You're on. Say hello, David. How's everyone doing today? Hope everyone's being safe. We'll get off. Hope everyone's being safe at home and uh, out and about doing <coughs> things responsibly. That's a special uh, hello to everybody after this glorious uh, Easter holiday weekend. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bill Karsten, District Three. Councillor Karsten, did we did we lose you? Are you on mute? I wonder. All right, we'll come back to Councillor Karsten. Councillor Nickel, are you with us? I believe I am. We have an interruption coming in because someone's trying to do a presentation, so our screen is being. Uh, divided and it's not under our control. So back to Phil and the producer for saying that. But yes, um, happy belated Easter to everyone. Hope everyone stayed safe. And the message, common message is still stay home. Right on. Councillor Austin. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm here and uh, all is well. How did your kids enjoy Easter? <laughs> they had a good Easter break, Mr. Bear. The Easter Bunny was able to find her house even with COVID-19. Awesome. Councillor Mancini, my councillor, are you out there? Yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to take this moment to thank all the frontline uh, healthcare workers. And particularly, I want to single out my sister-in-law, Annette McCormick, who works at the infirmary as a nurse. And Annette, thank you for all the work that you do, and thank you to all your colleagues for your service. Thank you, Councillor Wayne Mason. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Greetings from District 7 at Halifax South Downtown. Um, I'm going to thank, I'm going to give a shout out to my neighbor, Laura Carter, who with her husband, Scott, lives across the road in a three bedroom house with three boys under six. <laughs> and uh, it's been delightful for the last uh, couple of weeks that around two o'clock, and uh, if you're lucky, the viewers and council will get to hear this. Uh, she sends the two older boys, who are I think six and four and a half, out into the driveway with instructions to just to scream as loud as they want while they run up and down. So I want to really uh, give a shout out to Scott and Laura, who are uh, frankly uh, troopers, just uh, doing a great job over there right across the road. All right, indeed, thank you. Councillor Smith, are you with us? I am with you, Mr. Mayor, and hello, everybody. And 
I want to also give a big shout out to all the essential workers out there, our bus drivers, our folks in the grocery stores who are who are working hours and hours on end to, to provide the services we need. So thank you and hope everyone had a good Easter and stay safe. I assume that's your summer home behind you that uh, we're seeing. Yeah, I'm just waiting for my friend Goku to come. <laughs> Councillor uh, Cleary, I know you're with us. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and hello to everyone out there. Uh, and to echo what folks have been saying, thanks to all those who are on the front lines, whether you're in a grocery store, liquor store, you're in a hospital, uh, you're in transportation, moving essential goods, or you're driving one of our buses or ferries. Um, also, just a shout out too to the, uh, the Quinpool Road Business Association. They went online today with quinpool.shop. So of course, you'll be able to find your local uh, favorite Quinpool store, uh, either through that platform or through their own website, which has links to it. And again, that's quinpool.shop, S-H-O-P. Support your local business in your community, please. Awesome. Yeah, Carla's doing a cool job with that, with some of the other residents and the businesses at uh, Quinpool. Councillor uh, Walker, say hello. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, to all those on the front lines, uh, stay safe. And uh, everything's fine here in District 10. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor uh, Adams. Councillor Adams, are you on mute? That's the best he's ever sounded. Councillor Adams, are you with us? Yep. I'm back. back here. Go ahead, say a few words. Uh, a few words. How's that? Awesome. There we Is that are. working? I'm just, just going to say that uh, Russell's uh, tie, he must have got that at a plumbing supply store. Bunch of little toilet seats on it. Um, this is the first uh, Easter in recent memory that I haven't had a chance to spend with uh, my mom and dad and, and uh, my wife and kids. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna make up for it in the summer. Awesome, awesome. Councillor Zarowski, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, like my colleagues, I want to echo in general. Thanks to all the frontline workers, and that includes people working in the service industry, working with HRM, whether it's HRP, fire, or driving our transit buses. Thank you all for, for doing your work. And specifically, I wanted to send out congratulations to a constituent who is the daughter of a constituent who has been my neighbor for the better part of 20 years. Julian McDonald is a brand spanking new RN who's going to be working on the front lines, keeping us safe and keeping us healthy. And I'd also like to thank my other neighbor, who is a constable with HRP, uh, Sean Flynn, doing wonderful work in making sure that we're all safe. So in general, thank you all in specific congratulations and thank you. Great, thank you. Councillor Whitman, you're with us. I'm pleased to be here. Hi, Mayor Savage. Hello, colleagues. Hi to everyone watching. Uh, happy Easter. I'd like to send out a congratulations to uh, my son who just graduated from Acadia University and is starting virtually with IBM next month at the uh, the Bedford campus. And uh, thanks to everyone who's been contacting me over the past couple of weeks. I appreciate the uh, the comments and the feedback and I look forward to today. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, just a reminder to practice uh, safe social distancing and a reminder, if it is at all possible, please donate to the food bank because they can use it this uh, at this time more, more than ever. So if you can give, please do. Thank you. Mr. Thank Mayor, you. Are those two pictures and uh, is that Councillor Walker and <laughs> Councillor Mancini? <laughs> Moving on, Councillor Russell, normally the man of props. Councillor Russell. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I'd like to uh, welcome everybody again to the council meeting. Um, we've been hearing some good things around Sackville. Uh, lots of people are wanting to use the trail and respecting that they can't. And I really appreciate that. I know how much the trails around here are loved and the and the ball fields and the Met field. 
Um, I have behind me uh, the Sackville Library, another very popular place, and I just I appreciate that people are respecting the rules as much as possible so that hopefully we will be able to get rid of this virus just as quickly as we can. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you very much. Let's go to Bedford. Councillor Outhead. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and like uh, my colleagues, I want to send best wishes and thank you to all those essential workers and first responders as well. I also want to send thanks out to staff who I know all of us have been uh, pestering uh, with a lot of questions in almost every department lately, and the response team has been, has been fabulous even over the weekend, so much appreciated. I hope the media is listening to this because I think a great headline would be that people that live across the street from Way Mason scream daily. Uh, just, uh, just a thought. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Best to everyone. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, Jacques, Jacques Dubé. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. So, <clears throat> hello, everyone. All is well in the CEO's office and the team doing well. Uh, all the directors are working hard and we're responding to the challenges as we as we meet them. Thank you. Johnny Traves. Afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Council. There you are. OK, thank you. And I want to thank all the staff who've joined us as well. And I want to echo the thanks of the members of uh, Council for the people who continue to work. Um, doing work that uh, puts themselves in harm's way on our behalf and makes it all the more important that we follow the simple directions that we've been given in terms of social distancing and staying home as much as we can. Keeping in mind that there are some people that uh, are keeping the wheels turning and the lights on in the stores and uh, to our essential workers, the people who pick up the garbage on your corners, the people who are driving, operating the buses, uh, police and fire and people in the parks and so many others, we thank them very much. Uh, we had a high number of cases today, 40 some cases I see, but also a very high number of tests. And so the work continues. Colleagues, we will uh, thank you for that. Um, I'll accept the meeting to adjourn. We're done now. No, we're not. No, it just seems like it. Approval of the minutes. There's none. Approval of the order of uh, business. Uh, do we have anything, Madam Clerk, on the agenda? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, there are no added items today. Anybody else? Councilor, Councilor Nichols, Nichols moving the approval of the order of business. Thank you. Second, Whitman. Seconded by Councilor Whitman. All those in favor signify by taking yourself off mute and screaming aye. 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 Opposed? And that is the order of business on the consent agenda. Uh, Councillor Whitman has indicated to take um, 8.1.2 off consent, so we will do that. Thank you. Anybody else, or does somebody want to move the consent agenda with that change? Moved by Whitman. Moved by Councillor Whitman, seconded by? Lisa will second. Deputy Mayor seconded. Uh, on the consent <coughs> agenda, I believe we have to vote on that. Uh, um, Madam Clerk, so we're going to do the vote. And for those who haven't watched this before, uh, because we don't have the machines, uh, the uh, clerk, Cheryl Murphy, will re call the roll and people will vote. So this is on the uh, consent agenda, and I'm delighted to let people know that Bill Karsten is back with us. So, uh, Cheryl, please. So we're going to begin voting. Uh, Councillor Stretch. Yes, uh, thank you. In favor of the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Yes. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Yes. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yay. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Councillor Adams. Uh, 
I got to note the Councillor Adams's last contact. Okay. Councillor Sorowski. Yes. Yes. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Yes. Councillor Blackburn. I vote yes. Councillor Russell. Yes. Councillor Outit. Yes. Mayor Savage. I vote yes, and I see that Councillor Adams is back on the line. Councillor Adams. I uh, I'm in agreement for. That's okay. 17 in favor. Thank you very much. So that is the uh, uh, consent agenda passed. Calls for declaration of conflict of interest. Hearing none uh, on deferred business. Uh, this has passed on consent, I believe. And this is the, um, was this the one that was passed? Yeah, 6.1, which is the disposal of surplus property uh, for Fernhill Drive in Dartmouth. Supplemental report. So, Councillor Mancini, that's passed on consent. Thank you, colleagues. Um, we'll go to correspondence. Uh, Madam Clerk, correspondence. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have correspondence uh, distributed to the clerk's office on items 8.2.2 and 9.1, and that was circulated to members of council. Thank you. Uh, petitions, colleagues? I have a petition, Your Worship. Go ahead. Who is Thank it? You. Steve Adams, Councillor Adams. Thank you. And uh, this is titled, I Can't Drive 55. And then and below that is um, in a 60, 70, 80 kilometer an hour zone. Um, we went from 12 to two passing lanes and we the undersigned a petition to have them returned. So this is for both the uh, old Sambra Road and the Ketch Harbor Road. Uh, heading south from Marion Cove to Sambra, we lost two lanes in Halibut Bay, one in Portuguese Cove, two just before Duncan Cove Road, and one at the top of Ketch Harbor Hill before Sandy Cove Road, one at Bayside, and continuing around the loop, heading north from Sambra through Harrisfield, one at the Grover Dip, and one just before Baba's Pizzeria. So don't know what the process is with this, but I can sign it and uh, leave it uh, uh, with the clerk. And uh, we can proceed from there. Is that uh, is that reasonable? Yeah, yeah. that's good. Thank, Thank you. you. Petitions, colleagues. If there's no other petitions, we will move to reports uh, eight point one point one. Uh, I think Councillor Stretch will move this, and this is the award for the purchase of a new mid-mount aerial apparatus. Councillor Stretch, are you prepared to move that? Uh, yes, I am, uh, Your Worship. I'd like to put the following motion on the floor and ask for Council's uh, support. Uh, I hereby move that the Halifax Regional Council award tender number 20-100 for the purchase of one new mid-mount 100-foot aerial apparatus to Micmac Fire for $1,854,744 net HST included with funding from project account number CE180002 fire fleet replacement to be changed to CE20002 in 2020-2021 as outlined in the financial implications section of the staff report dated March 17, 2020. So moved. Council Seconded by Whitman. Seconded by Councilor Carsten. Uh, discussion, Councillor Stretch? No, I'm good to go. It's uh, pretty well self-explanatory mm -hmm. and an investment uh, in our fire services for greater protection in the community of worship. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a couple of speakers and then there may be more. Uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a quick question for our staff. Uh, I, I see in the report that there was only one bid received. Um, so I guess I have two kind of questions that lead from that. Um, is this considered a good price, uh, given that there was only one bid? And uh, if it's not considered a good price, what are our options to, to retender? Uh, how vital is the piece of equipment? Uh, what other implications are there? Thank you. Okay, so I'm not sure. Jerry Blackwood and Ken Stubing are the two names I have here. Chief, um, who would like to speak to that? 
Thank you, Mayor. Through you to the councilor, it's Ken Stubing, the Fire Chief and Director for Fire and Emergency Services. I can certainly start the conversation and uh, then defer to my colleague uh, in Fleet for anything else he'd like to add. Thank so you. specifically for the question, um, this was tendered uh, to basically buy a truck off the off the shelf, so to speak. Uh, not a lot of bells and whistles, although it is a little bit of a different design for us. It's a, a proven manufacturer, one that's provided uh, the most stability in our aerial force, and that being uh, Pierce currently. We've got a lot of comfort with that uh, product being uh, reliable. So there are some efficiencies for fleet to maintain parts, uh, certainly some efficiencies from operators knowing how to use the product that we currently already have, although this is a mid mount, which means it's going to be a little bit more maneuverable than uh, than what our rear mount is and able to get into some tighter spaces that normally we rely on our Bronto to do. The problem is our Bronto is nearing the end of its life and it is expensive to repair, time consuming to repair because the parts come from Finland as is outlined in the report. Uh, because it was uh, a purchase that needed to be done very, very quickly to get some stability in our aerial platform uh, needs. Uh, we went to a tender process that said, you need to have something ready to come off the line quickly. So that speaks to why there's a limited response to the tender because we were looking for efficiencies with the manufacturer as well as uh, something that was able to meet our needs quickly. Okay, thank you, Chief. Was there anything else anybody else wanted to add from staff? Thank you, Chief for Councillor Cleary. Uh, thank you very much. So um, I guess just to, uh, it wasn't answered fully, but maybe uh, Mr. Blackwood could. In terms of the price, is this considered a good price for this? I understand the need for it and I support the need for it and I'm happy to hear it's more maneuverable. Um, I just wonder, is it a good price considering the process? Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> through you, Council Clary. Um, we, we consider it a good price uh, based on the uh, specifications and, and the uh, term to delivery. Um, our capital budget <clears throat> uh, that we submitted for that was about $1.8 million. And uh, the tender came in uh, about 50000 higher. So you know, we, we consider that a um, was a competitive bid uh, based on our estimate. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Chief, did you want to say something? Else? Yes, I was. Uh, thank you through <coughs> you, Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, sorry, I was starting to answer that question and got distracted. Sorry uh, about the virtual presence here. Maybe that's uh, a little bit new for me. Uh, the Bronto, the device that I mentioned earlier, is a very, very expensive piece of apparatus and our goal is that to actually find something with uh, more uh, usable um, capabilities than the current rear mount and re less reliance on the Bronto. So conceivably, the cost for this device is significantly less than a Bronto if we were to replace it with a Bronto. And I would echo what was just meant uh, said earlier that this is a good value. This is a you know it's not like we're overpaying based on the fact that we had limited response, but because we also bought uh, a stock truck, there are some efficiencies there as well. We didn't add a lot of bells and whistles to the truck. Uh, we tried to tender a truck that was uh, able to meet our needs, but uh, good value for the dollar. Thanks, okay. Mr. Blackwood, Chief Steubing, and thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question was actually the same as Councillor Cleary's, but uh, I would mind, Jerry, to elaborate a little bit more, please. Uh, you say it was in the budget. Is it common that we have for in fleet, is it, uh, that we only have the one vendor that uh, stepped up to the plate when we when this tender went out? Uh, in, in the past, when we and I know it's been some time since we've had a new vehicle of this type from fire, but they've had other fire vehicles. Do we typically only get the, the, the one company uh, responding to a tender or other times when we have multiple companies? Uh, <clears throat> it's a good question, Councillor. I would say that, you know, in mo most uh, 
complete um, <clears throat> tenders or request for proposal, we, we would typically we get more than one um, vendor that, that would submit a proposal. Um, <clears throat> and this one here, again, to, to the chief's uh, point, it was uh, we needed something to be delivered within this current fiscal year. So, uh, which is why we went with the stock unit. But overall, we we tend to get uh, you know um, you know at least three three uh, bids on our on our uh, on our um, tenders um, within within the fire um, <clears throat> procurements. It is a, a more of a specialized uh, market, so uh, you know having having two to three is is not uncommon. Thank you, Mr. Blackwood. That's good for me, uh, Mr. Mayor. And I can see why the chief was distracted in his question. If you look out his window, that's pretty tough, uh, Chief. I don't know how, you, know how you get any work done, but thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Whitman. No, Councillor Whitman had the same question, took himself off the list. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Anybody else ready for the question? Let's call, call for the, the roll. question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Stretch. Uh, yes, I'll be voting for the motion. Councillor Hensman. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Yes. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yay. Councillor Walker. Or. Councillor Adams. Or. Councillor Sarowski. Or. Councillor Whitman. I'm in favor. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting in favor. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhead. Councillor Outhead. For the motion. And Mayor Savage. For the motion, I declare the motion carried. Thank you. We'll go to 8.1.2. It was taken off consent, um, so it will have to be moved. Uh, Councillor Whitman, I don't know if you want to move it or if you want to get Councillor sure. Mason to move. Councillor Whitman. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage. Uh, the motion is that Halifax Regional Council award the design and construction of a protected bike lane along a portion of Lower Water Street fronting the Queen's Mark development to the Armour Group Limited in the amount of $225,619.84 net HST included with funding from capital budget CR200007 Regional Centre AAA Bikeways as outlined in the financial implications section of the staff report dated March 13, 2020 pending approval of the 2020-21 capital budget. Second. Mason. Second by Councillor Mason. Councillor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage. Thank you. So a couple of questions for uh, for staff and uh, maybe so the public can hear the uh, the answers. I noticed uh, this one um, is a sole source. Uh, unlike the la like the last bid on the fire truck, it uh, has one bidder on it, but I believe this one was uh, we intended to do business with just uh, the armor groups so of staff could comment on that. Uh, secondly, um, although we look like we're approving this today, is this work already complete? Has the work already been completed? And thirdly, for staff, there's a, a another narrow pinch point right by the um, the Museum of the Atlantic, where there's the uh, very very thin uh, sidewalk. How will that work into this uh, bike lane um, uh, situation? Will that be widened to make room for bikes as well? Okay, who do we have on staff? Is it Ashley that we have? Hi, good afternoon. How are you doing? Hi, good. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to the councillors, my name is Ashley Bissett and I'm the Program Manager for Development Engineering. Um, the first question is, is that this was uh, uh, deemed a sole source contract through the procurement policy. Um, we were able to do that because it was work that was being done alongside adjacent to, easiest explanation, adjacent to the development site. The area was contained um, between Prince and George Street. 
um, and it made sense to take this opportunity and work with the developer uh, to, to meet with the cost efficiencies and uh, to, for construction purposes and costs as well. So for your first question, the second question is um, the Armour Group is currently finishing reinstatement of their own, of their portion of the, the construction, so the sidewalk and part of the boulevard. And they've also prepped some of the bike way, um, the bike lane on along Lower Water Street as well. And uh, so that work um, is, uh, is ongoing right now uh, with the state of, of things out there. And the section I believe you're asking about, the pinch point is in front of the museum, is that correct? And Correct. so that that section there will be um, completed as well. There'll be a transition there um, to widen the sidewalk in front of the museum and um, remove some of the boulevards. And there there will be a slight bike lane as well there. And then that will transition further into um, the future plans for Lower Water Street. So that that area will be improved as well. Thank you, Councillor Whitman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage, and uh, thank you, Ashley, for the response. I'm pleased to see that um, we are going with the Armour Group uh, because this is just one block in question here. And although the price seems like a lot at all, almost a quarter million dollars for a block of bike lane, it's a lot better than we've paid at other times for bike lanes. And just um, a similar situation occurred in front of the curve and the pavilion where the developer there was going to um, be able to do the the uh, bike lane at a huge savings to HRM, but we tendered it anyway and, and paid a lot more. It's a reason why this time we went with the uh, proposal to go with the lowest bidder and the best price for the taxpayer, but on the Curve Pavilion South Park, we didn't. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, the Queen's Mark is a little bit of a different situation than the Curve and the Pavilion. Um, what happened with the Queen's Mark was um, we didn't, HRM didn't have a, 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 a project in place already along Lower Water Street. So what happened was is the developer and HRM staff worked together on a, on a plan, a design that would uh, allow the developer's design to tie in. And then we have the option to either come in later, HRM to come in later and construct the bike lane or take this opportunity with the developer and construct the bike lane now uh, through their contractor um, and uh, minimize the impacts on a, on a quite a busy area of road in the future. So just have all the all the disruption now while the development is being finished. Um, this is a little bit different than the the curve in the pavilion where there was already a bike lane um, project approved and awarded, um, and um, uh, and staff took on the cost of the design there. They they are similar when you look at them on the surface, but um, but the details of them are, are quite different. Uh, thank you. And how much do you figure we saved by doing it this way? Because there's definitely savings of doing it the way that we're proposing. Yeah, I uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. I don't have a, a, um, a definite answer, but this what happened here is we had uh, the developer. It was a design, um, a construction and materials job. So um, I would say there were significant savings there. Um, there was quite a bit of uh, civil and electrical work that was done as well, so uh, that was that was taken on as well. So I'd say that there was it was a fair amount of savings. Thank you. I'll support it. Thank you very much, uh, oh, Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I have a notice of motion I'm going to bring at the end of this meeting uh, regarding the other side of the street. It was beyond the scopes to council. I'll just say it was beyond the scopes of this because it's really only about reinstatement. Uh, in front of Queen's Mark. And when you look at the plan on page six, you can see the detail in front of the museum, the Robertson building and the uh, Mitchell house. And so I'm gonna bring a motion to widen the sidewalk uh, to ask for staff report uh, to include it in next year's budget, not the one that we're about to approve, but the one after. Uh, because uh, those of you who are familiar with downtown may have walked around the corner from Strange Adventures and been faced on the west side of that sidewalk with a, uh, 
light standard right there blocking the sidewalk so wheelchairs can't get by and people in walkers can't get by and uh and someone with a stroller couldn't get by so uh, now that the street has been is being realigned this is an opportunity to rehabilitate that sidewalk which is failing old 40 year old uh brick and to uh, try and address the the really dire mobility issues, but uh, I guess uh, uh, you know that discussion is to come. But since we have this opportunity now, I just wanted to uh, flag for any councillors who are interested about why this isn't happening now. It has to come as a separate project. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Mason. Anybody else ready for the question? Ready for the All question. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Yes. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Uh, in favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. Councillor Mason. His mic is muted. Councillor Mason. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Clary. Yay. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Sorowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. For the motion. Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes. Councillor Russell. Yay. Councillor Outhit. For the motion. Councillor Mason. He just signaled to me that he's for the motion. His computer crashed. Can't do that. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that, Mayor Savage. So, um, yes, for the motion, Councillor Mason, are you with us still? Back. Okay. Okay. So that's sixteen in favor. Okay. All right, that passes. Thank you. Um, just a note to our producer: I'm getting notes that camera is staying on me and not going to the speaker. Is that something that we're that you're aware of? Uh, Producer Phil. Pardon me? Oh, his computer's having issues. All right, let's carry forward. Uh, item 8.1.3, Councillor Karsten. This is municipal and CSAP elections, methods, and alternative voting dates. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'd be pleased to put the motion on the floor uh, that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt option 1 as outlined in attachment A of the staff report dated March 19th, 2020 and direct uh, A that the use of telephone personal computing device as the only method of voting to be used in the 2020 municipal and CSAP elections during alternate alternative uh, polling days, including during the advanced polls, and B, that paper ballot be used as the only method of voting on ordinary polling day. Uh, two, set the dates for alternative voting to commence on Tuesday, October 6, 2020 at 8 a.m. and run continuously through Wednesday, October 14, 2020 at 7 p.m. I so move. Mr. Second Mayor. by Councilor Mancini. Second, Councilor Smith. So, Mr. Mayor, I, I don't have much to add. Uh, this is a formality that we need to go through uh, every every four years. Uh, I thought I'd uh, put the motion on the floor for discussion, and uh, uh, I'll leave it at that, as Councillor Walker says. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cleary. Start us off. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. And um, I, you know, given given where we are and how we normally do things, and I, I do love paper ballots and I do love uh, sort of that tradition of walking to your polling station and, and casting your vote. Uh, I believe in the report and I believe seeing the information from last uh, the last general election for the municipal uh, elections in, in 2016, 
the vast majority of people voted um, electronically. And given where we are with COVID, and I know we we could be cresting the, the first wave and, um, you know, going back to some sort of new normal in, in the next number of months, but given that this is likely to be with us for a while, we're probably going to be practicing social distance uh, for many months to come. Um, and I'm fine with this as it stands now, but I just want some assurance from our staff that we are working on contingencies and could implement an uh, e-election only if we're still going with the October election. Uh, uh, and, you know, we haven't heard anything different from the provincial government, so I'm assuming so. Um, so just, you know, what, what, are, what are staff's thoughts on, you know, how set in stone is this? Can How nimble are we? Can we do an e-vote if we need to in October? Would you, uh, Cheryl, perhaps? Yes. <clears throat> we can't hear her, Mr. Mayor. Is your mute on, uh, Cheryl? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as you would note, the there is a uh, an alternative in the staff report uh, that uh, calls for an all e vote and. Uh, once we have the e-vote in place, we can certainly expand it for a total election. For a full general election. Dr. Clary? So we uh, we would have then the even, and again, I, I, I love paper ballots and I do want to go down this road, but if we get to say August, September, and we're still doing the October vote and you know we're still social distancing, we could, you know, I guess literally flip a switch and say, hey, you know what, we're sending out all the information to the electorate to say it's going to be electronic only and here's how we're going to do it. So we can do that, you know, if we go further down this road. I just, that's the only assurance I'm looking for. I know the alternative there is to say now, but I just want to do paper now, but maybe July, August, September, revisit this if we need to. So I guess it probably wouldn't be as late as September, but uh, we could do it in July or August. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, it's interesting. I understand that the staff are recommend, recommending uh, option one, but in the report, I'm not crystal clear why they're recommending uh, option one. Uh, I see the cost is the same for all three options. Uh, uh, Councillor Cleary made reference to uh, his comments with COVID-19, um, and I'm trying to understand what other municipalities are doing. How are they measuring the the uh, the by election we had uh, most recently, uh, how do they measure that successful or not successful? All of that wasn't clear in the report, so I wonder if the staff could uh, speak to that, please. Um, we we are recommending uh, what we felt there was a desire or a an appetite from the public for. Um, the it is a little different than our previous election in that all of our advance poll is electronic and uh, and only on uh, election day is it paper and it's only paper on election day. Um, certainly uh, the special election was quite successful, but we don't believe that there's an appetite with the public uh, for a totally electronic vote. Let me just go. Through. And and at this point, we don't have any indication from the province that they are in any way, shape, or form looking at uh, canceling any any elections or looking for municipalities to do uh, elections in a different manner. Okay. Thank you, John Treves. Did you want to speak? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, thank you to council. You know, the, the reality is that it could go either way, but we recognize that there is a large number, or say large number, there are still a lot of people who either do not have the means to vote electronically or are, are prevented. So our preference would be to have some measure of paper ballots. Um, and that's why the direction at this point is to go that way. And if it turns out as we get closer to election day, that that's not possible for fo for social distancing and other reasons, then we'll pivot to electronic at that time. Well, Mr. Good. Mayor, you know, um, seeing where we are with COVID-19, seeing that, uh, you know, when we come out of COVID-19, uh, we're going to have a new normal. 
And uh, why not, uh, you know, anticipate that? And yes, I understand that what uh, John just said, that not everybody has electronic. That's why I think option three is uh, the direction we should go for. So uh, I would like to put on the floor today that uh, we go after option three. OK, option one is on the floor. I think we'd have to defeat option one, John, to go to option Correct. three. Correct. Anything else? I just feel uh, that, uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, uh, sorry, didn't mean to inter interrupt Mr. Mayor, go ahead. No. Go ahead if you want to finish up. Yeah, I just, you know, I think, you know, option three, uh, the paper ballot is still there for those that like the traditional method. Uh, but yet, you know, for the probably the majority of our citizens, they do have access and uh, we'll give them the opportunity to do electronic uh, on the day, uh, not only in advance. So uh, I would ask colleagues to vote down on option one and, and we can go right to option three. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. And I was going to make the same suggestion that uh, Councillor Mancini made uh, with uh, moving to option three. Of course, I was elected in uh, October with the fully electronic method. And one of the things that we found when we were canvassing was that a large number of people didn't want to or weren't able to uh, cast their votes electronically. So I appreciate having the uh, paper option available. I think having it available only on election day is still limiting. There are a number of people who will not go out to vote if they are only able to vote electronically. They want to cast their ballot in paper. They want to uh, enjoy the social exercise of, of getting around other people, even though we can't do that today. We will be able to do it in October. I really hope so. Um, but again, we are seeing an, a large number of people who will not do it, and so the number of people who will vote is going to be down by uh, by that uh, group of people. So having the paper ballots available on one day through the election is better, but it still eliminates those people who are not willing or not able to vote and are not here on election day. And option three has uh, being able to vote by paper ballot on multiple days through the election. And so that would be uh, by far uh, the best option as far as uh, getting people out to be able to vote. Um, I am very appreciative that the report does mention paper ballots. One of the things that I was uh, very leery of, very cautious of, was having a strictly electronic vote, um, considering uh, many of the security implications around uh, electronic uh, communication or voting or anything else. Um, and so again, I, I would encourage my colleagues to vote down this motion option one and vote for option three. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. I concur. Uh, I see the only difference between option one and option three is that option one does not allow for advanced poll ballots by paper. So uh, I prefer option three, but I still have some reservations about option three. Only having one polling station per district for advanced polls. Consider the size of my district, two and a half hour drive from one end to the other. How is it fair for, for a district of my size or, or a councillor stretch that has just one polling location for the entire district? I think that there should be some uh, geographical uh, uh, consideration given here. There should be at least minimum three advanced polling stations from my particular district, and perhaps the same for Council Stretch, and perhaps some um, could be a couple for for Council Whitman for the South Shore riding. I think there has to be some uh, some consideration to the uh, to the to the vastness of those large geographical areas. I'm also concerned about electronic and, and telephone voting uh, in regards to uh, as Councillor Cleary said. People like to have that old fashioned mark the ballot uh, type of experience. I in rural parts of Halifax don't have internet capacity in a lot of places. We have some phones, but some people are not uh, leery about voting on phones, especially the seniors. They're more likely to go prefer to go vote at a polling station. So, and also the question I asked through some of my emails to staff is I was not uh, happy with the amount of polls we had in District 2. Uh, the last election. If you look at the, the voters uh, list for federal and provincial elections, uh, they had much more uh, polling stations uh, through the same areas. So 
A voter is a voter is a voter. So why should they be treated differently municipally, provincially, and federally? We should have the same amount of polling stations or available or the availability to vote on every election equally. So therefore, I am also requesting that if we're going to go with option three, I think we should also revisit the amount of polls per district and at least have them somewhat similar to the provincial and federal standards with regards to the amount of polls and uh, where they've traditionally been held. So that's where my feeling is, Mr. Mayor. I prefer option three, but still it's not perfect. Mr. Trace, are you trying to get in or I'm not quite sure? No, I'm good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Count, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yeah, I'm going to uh, echo much of uh, what uh, Councillor Hansby just said and point out that uh, the special uh, election that was just held, uh, I visited a couple of polling stations during that day. And, you know, as convenient as the online is, um, you know, the, the real, the real uh, task here will be finding polling locations for the advanced polling days that will be, you know, centrally located, but also has the the Wi-Fi or the uh, the internet capabilities that are available because uh, using the uh, the uh, this summer's uh, uh, special election, you know, if uh, you went to vote, you walked into the polling station and you were greeted with uh, somebody there with an iPad who helped you walk through the process. And I know that there was discussions had at the time about, you know, how secure is your vote in that type of situation. Uh, and I do have concerns about the one polling location per district uh, on those advanced polling days, because uh, what is uh, what you're able to uh, to set up might not be convenient for the, the vast majority of people. So uh, I'd like to see that perhaps expanded a bit to uh, more than just one polling location per district. But uh, I, I am leading towards option three at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stretch. Thank you very much, Your Worship. And uh, uh, all things considered, I have to say that I'll uh, as well be voting down the motion that's on the floor and opting for option three. As Councillor Hensby and uh, uh, Deputy Mayor just articulated, uh, I also want to see uh, greater opportunities uh, in some of the uh, more uh, rural and uh, larger districts. Uh, Councillor Hensby is absolutely correct. The Eastern Shore, no different than uh, up to the Muscadab Valley, uh, uh, is almost a two hour drive from one end to the other of the district. And uh, uh, just to have uh, single polling districts would not be equitable and, in my mind, uh, not fair. So. We're, we're dancing around this. Nobody has put an amendment on to that effect. I guess I want to ask if that's necessary or if uh, staff are hearing, uh, indeed, depending on the vote, uh, what council is saying, Your Worship. I guess that would be after this vote, wouldn't it, if that was the case? Well, I think if you're speaking about an option that's not on the floor now, you'd probably wait till that option. If that, if this is defeated, yeah. you'd wait for the new option to come on and look at an amendment with my guess, Cheryl. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Well, I will yield to uh, to Councillor Hensby, uh, who brought this up first, and uh, indeed, uh, I believe that there needs to be more than one physical location in uh, uh, in the major or in uh, certain districts, uh, especially in the one that I and he and, and two or three others represent. So, I'll be voting against this motion and look forward to uh, option three being put on the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, uh, Mason. Councillor Mason. Did we lose Councillor Mason again? We'll try him again in a second. I I'll think, go. I think, is it working? Can you hear yeah, me? We got you. Right. My video keeps cutting out, so I don't know if it'll, yeah, I think you just got a frozen face there, right? Eh? Yep. All right, well, just turn that off. You're just going to have to listen. Um, so uh, I agree with a lot of what I've heard about polling places. Uh, uh, Council's heard me say for the last seven years, I'm not a fan of the electronic voting. I feel like it's convenience that costs us a ton of money and hasn't moved the needle at all in terms of actual uh, uh, number of people who are turning out for the polls. Uh, back in the old uh, city of Halifax days, 20 and 30 years ago, they would set up for a half day with a box 
uh, in the uh, foyer of every major apartment building. And the turnout at that time was, you know, 20, 30 percent of the population more than it is now. You know, you're talking 50s and 60s. Uh, we have uh, tried to, to enhance uh, voter turnout by spending an awful lot of money on electronic voting the last uh, seven, eight years. And the trend is still downward. So it's not getting us anything. It's just costing us a ton of money. So, uh, you know, I don't think this is a uh, Eastern Shore or Muscatawba Valley issue. It's uh, people need to be able to conveniently vote issue. And, uh, you know, uh, again, having roving ballot boxes to me would be w worth the money uh, for a half day here and a half day there, like we do at the Man Seniors Manors, but going to apartment buildings and, and, and uh, towns and villages. I think that's going to get a better result for for the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we're spending on electronic voting. So uh, I'll support the alternative, but but I, I say to council again, I'm not sure why uh, we are so hot on electronic voting at all. It hasn't really given us the uh, voter uh, turnout that we hope for. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Karsten. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. So. Uh, it's rather interesting that no one at all is uh, no one at all is supporting my motion. Surprise! Uh, I, I sort of anticipated this type of discussion. I wanted the motion on the floor uh, and uh, for discussion, and certainly I can support uh, option three as well. Uh, the the only thing that uh, and yet uh, Councillor Mason did make very good points in that uh, really whatever we've attempted, as he stated, uh, at at great cost. Uh, uh, to try to move the needle, as, as Councillor Mason said, hasn't really worked. Uh, we're, we're just still at the same numbers, basically, as we've been uh, uh, for, for a long, long time. Um, I'm, I'm a little surprised uh, that no one's mentioned that uh, uh, the president of NSFM, uh, Pam Mood, has actually written to the province for the Middle East, keep that on the radar, that this is a municipal election. And whatever happens, folks, in terms of uh, the social distancing thing, I don't think that uh, uh, an option would be for us just to go to electronic vote, uh, voting, as mentioned by a couple. Uh, I don't believe that would be an option if not all municipalities in Nova Scotia are prepared and able to do the same thing. And I'm not sure of the, the capabilities there. Uh, having said that, the, the other point I wanted to make on social distancing uh, pray to the good Lord above that we're not still at the social distancing by August, September and, and past that. Uh, but I would certainly, uh, and that's why I'm making it uh, the statement today, I would certainly hope that uh, we're watching that very, very carefully and that the province is watching that very carefully because if there's any anticipation of still being social distancing uh, by that late in this year, my goodness, uh, I, I respectfully suggest to all of my colleagues that's on this call, uh, that leaves a very, very a big disadvantage to any and all candidates uh, that would want to run for council seat. Uh, you know, I, I know that uh, in 2012, when we reduced the size of council and I had to run against uh, an incumbent, I started campaigning so that I could knock on every door in May of that year, 2012. So already we're getting that time of the year that uh, particularly new candidates that really are anxious about uh, looking forward to the October ele uh, election. I'm sure uh, candidates were, were gearing up, uh, ready to start knocking on doors within the next month, month and a half or so. So I'll just leave that on the floor. Uh, we talk about democracy. We talk about uh, having fair advantages uh, to all colleagues wanting more youth into the, in, into the uh, system, into the elected field, uh, more women certainly encouraged. encouraged. I don't think we can disadvantage them to the point of uh, making decisions uh, on voting or an election at all uh, go as late as August, September. Just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I'm happy to follow uh, Councillor Karsten on this because uh, I mean, I think he makes a good point, uh, so slightly off topic there, about what we're doing, social distancing, how it relates to electronic. Because, um, I mean, uh, we are starting to come into the campaign period. And if we are going to be social distancing for a huge period longer, I mean, I hope someone in the province is thinking about what that might mean for democracy, because good luck taking on any incumbent 
if you literally can't be knocking on doors out there, I mean, it becomes impossible to really do much of a campaign. So, uh, you know, there is some decisions that uh, will have to be made uh, for clarity, I think, for everyone in the province as a whole, because it's not just HRM on that. Um, I did want to just chime in and say, and just be cautious, colleagues. I mean, electronic voting certainly has not, it has not been the panacea here that solved our kind of ills in terms of turnout. Um, but just be cautious, because we also can't go back in time to prove a negative what the turnout would have been if it had only been in-person voting during that. I suspect personally it wouldn't have been all that different because I think what really motivates people to the polls are much more complex factors than whether or not and how accessible that polling station is. Um, so, but uh, I, I wouldn't want us to jump to just too many conclusions because we can't prove a negative, right? And unless we decide to scrap electronic voting and then kind of see how this election squares up against the others. Um, that's about the only way, only way, and even then it's not perfect. So just, just be cautious on that. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Hensby, you're going to wait for the next, the next one, to speak. Yes, sir. Thank you. Anybody else on the motion as it is right now? If not, we'll go to the question, uh, Cheryl, on the uh, motion on the floor. I think Cheryl needs to turn the microphone on. I didn't hear her. Councillor Stretch. Uh, yes, I'll be voting against this motion. Councillor Hensby. Opposed. Councillor Carson. Nay. Councillor Nickel. No. Councillor Austin. Uh, against. Councillor Mancini. Councillor Mancini. I've lost my mic. No, you're here. We can hear you. Just say yeah or nay, Tony. Councillor Mancini, we can hear you. Councillor Mason. Against the motion. Councillor Smith. Against the motion. Councillor Cleary. Nay. Councillor Walker. Against. Councillor Adams. Against. Councillor Shirowski. Nay. Councillor Whitman. Against. Councillor Blackburn. I vote no. Councillor Russell. Against the motion. Councillor Outhead. Against the motion. Councillor Mancini. Mayor Savage. No. So did you get my vote uh, on that? No, I'm, we didn't, Councillor Mancini. Can so you? my vote is nay. Okay. 17 against. So that's uh, 17 votes against. So, Tony, you were the first one to mention an alternative motion. Do you want to go ahead? Yes, please, uh, Mr. Mayor. And I, uh, hopefully, uh, the clerk can correct me if I have this uh, incorrectly. But uh, I'd like to put the following motion on the floor. The Halifax Regional Council, one, adopt option three as outlined in attachment A of the staff report dated March 19, 2020, and direct A that the use of telephone and personal commuting devices as the only method of voting used in the 2020 municipal and CSAP elections during alternative polling days, including during the advanced polls, and B, the paper ballot be used at all voting stations, including in advanced polling and on voting on ordinary polling day. Two, set the dates for alternative voting to commence on Tuesday, October 6, 2020, at 8 o'clock a.m. and run uh, through to Wednesday, October 14, 2020, at 7 o'clock p.m. So moved. I will second, second that, Paul Russell. Seconded by Councillor Russell. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Anything else? 
No, I think that's it, Mr. Mayor. I think I do. Uh, I don't know how we address, though. I'm looking for some direction on the uh, uh, multiple polling stations in some of our districts, if not all our districts, but particularly our more rural districts. So I don't know if that has to be a separate motion or one of my colleagues wants to make an amendment to this one. Uh, I'm uh, willing to uh, entertain that if that's the case. Thank you. Uh, I had Councillor Hensby next. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I believe that a, 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 either a request for a supplementary report on the amount of the polling stations per district, as well as compare that to federal and provincial elections in regards to the same geographical areas where they had polling stations. That's what I like to move in regards to the supplementary report on polling station locations yeah. per district. But with the particular motion on the floor now in option three, there should be a minimum of two advanced polling station locations, not just one per district. I prefer to see a minimum of three or perhaps four for my district, but uh, I guess that's not practical for the urban districts. And uh, unless we want to break the motion between rural and 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 um, and uh, urban districts, but the, those in suburban areas would have same similar challenges. So, uh, would 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 three would three polling stations per district be a, a reasonable number to ask for? Maybe I should ask for my colleagues on that particular uh, suggestion. Is perhaps we should amend that to a minimum of uh, three polling locations for bad polls per district. I'll move that as an amendment. So uh, you're looking for a supplementary report, Councillor? Well, I'd like to see the supplementary report on the amount of polling uh, locations per district, because I said in the past, uh, you know, that our provincial elections have a lot more polling stations than we do municipally, and a voter is a voter is a voter, so why should they be treated differently between elections? So I think we should try to uh, familiarize ourselves with that. We're trying to use all one same voters list. So why not just use all the same uh, voting locations? Mr. Mayor, Mr. Yeah, please go, so uh, we don't necessarily have access to all the same uh, locations. I would ask, I think, Council to consider a supplementary report before you decide to add any polling uh, stations in terms of the, the number. I think we can then take a look at the cost and the capacity to stand that up and then come back to you with a supplementary report and that'll give you some information to make a, a decision. So moved. Okay, that's accepted uh, by Councillor Hensby. Um, just in terms of order, Councillor Russell, did you want to speak to this one? If I can, I would appreciate it. You had signaled uh, that you would have moved it. I already had Councillor Mancini, so I'll give you a chance to speak to it if you wish. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I simply appreciate uh, the recognition of the importance of paper voting. Um, we have had a number of people in uh, Lower Sackville during the last election, so this was a great place to trial uh, electronic only, and so I, I appreciate that uh, people have opted for this. Having more places to vote would be very helpful. Um, having uh, a familiar that uh, a format that people are familiar with is very helpful. We had uh, one lady who was 89 years old who walked into a polling station and someone tried to help her out. And because she was totally unfamiliar with computers. And they were, they walked her through absolutely every aspect of it, including voting. And she was concerned about security, understandably, that uh, people were watching how she voted. And uh, I think by having the additional uh, polling stations, uh, sorry, the additional uh, uh, paper options, uh, there certainly helps with that. So certainly appreciate this. It sounds like everybody is going for that. Um, I am wondering about uh, what uh, Councillor Hensby has brought forward and wondering about a supplementary report in that I'm, I'm wondering if there's a timeliness aspect related to this. Uh, do we need to uh, make a decision on this in some reasonable time frame or do we just need to make a decision on it in the next month or two? So I think uh, the report would have to come back recognizing the uh election is coming upon us, right? John and Cheryl would have to be done in expeditiously in time that it could be implemented for the election. Correct. We we don't have any access to any polling locations, so we can't do much at this point, but we could have the report back, I think, by the first week in May. Okay. Councillor Russell, did you want to second the motion of Councillor Hensby? We didn't have a second. I can certainly do that, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, Councillor uh, Stretch. 
Thank you very much, Your Worship, and thank you to uh, uh, Councillor Mancini, Hensby, and uh, uh, Councillor Paul Russell. I, I will be supporting the motion as it is on the floor uh, as well. I think uh, uh, John and, and Cheryl and our staff are hearing uh, pretty clearly what uh, what Council is looking for today. It is important, you know, Your Worship, I've, uh, I've run eight elections in the last uh, 20 years, and it's very important that we give uh, voters every opportunity and every option as they see fit. It's fine for us uh, uh, that are familiar with the technology and even to be having a virtual meeting like this today, but there are those that would opt not to vote electronically and it is vital that uh, uh, their rights and, uh, and wishes be respected. So I think this motion with the amendment and indeed uh, uh, looking for a supplemental report, uh, clearly uh, council has articulated that and I will be supporting uh, the motion, thank you. Thank you. So we are on the amendment of the motion. Councillor uh, Outhead. Uh, just very quickly, uh, I'm certainly happy to support the amendment. We'll do so. And as far as the main motion, I'm going to support option three, but a lot of this is going to be out of our hands. I don't think we will be self-isolating and distancing uh, in October if all goes well with spring and summer, but we're also expecting a second wave to be quite a possibility in the fall. So it could be such a thing as that we will get with very few days notice, uh, Dr. Strang and the Premier going on the radio and TV and saying as of tomorrow at noon, we're back to self-isolating, we're back to social distancing. And I think staff, as they mentioned, are going to have to stay nimble on this because with very little notice, uh, this actually could change dramatically that it would be electronic only. So I, I, I don't know if John or uh, Cheryl want to speak to that, but I, it's fine for us to give this direction now and I support it, but it could change in a day's notice in the fall with the second wave. Correct, thank you. Councillor um, Adams. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Worship. And I, I, I know the discussion has gone a couple of different ways here, but I, I do agree that we need to get uh, a little more in the uh, for access in the more rural areas. You know, for example, uh, I know that uh, the other areas like Steve and Dave are two, two, three hours wide. Uh, if you were to leave one end of uh, District 11, go to the other at three in the morning with no traffic, it is an hour, and that is on the on the, the best of conditions. So, um, even if there was, you know, the uh, like one in each specific area, like you know, District 11 would require, I think, would at least require two. Um, but in that supplementary report, I would like to ask, uh, previous to um, the the uh, seats going from 23 to uh, 16, find out how many actual polling stations there were. I know we didn't have electronic voting back then, uh, but I'd like to know how many polling stations there were uh, in total or per district, whatever is easier to do, and uh, bring that information back, and we could use that as some type of a reference for what we may need for a paper ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor uh, Austin. Councillor Austin, are you on mute? Councillor, oh, he's good. Cancel that. Okay. Um, okay, I think that's everybody that wanted to speak on this. We're we're on the amendment. Are we ready for the question on the amendment? Question. Question. On the amendment, uh, Cheryl, call the roll. Are you uh, off mute? I am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Stretch. Yes, I'll be voting uh, in favor of the amendment. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Four. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin? Uh, in favor. Councillor Mancini? In favor. Councillor Smith? In favor. Councillor Clary? Yay. Missed me, Cheryl. Oh, Councillor Mason? Uh, four. Councillor Walker? Four. Councillor Adams? Four. Councillor Zorowski. Four. Councillor Whitman. In favor. 
Deputy Mayor Blackburn. I vote yes. Councillor Russell. For the amendment. Councillor Outhead. For the amendment. Mayor Savage. For the amendment. It's 17 in favor. So we have an amended motion. Are we ready for the question on the motion as amended? Question. Let's call the roll. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. For. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. For. Councillor Mason. Councillor Mason. He's there. Four. <laughs> Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yay. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Four. Councillor Sorowski. Councillor Sorowski. Four. Councillor Whitman. In favor. Councillor Blackburn. I'm voting yes. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outit. For the motion. Mayor Savage. I vote for the motion and I declare that the motion is uh, carried. Uh, colleagues, we're going to just take a short break, uh, in particular for Councillor Mason to get uh, his technology um, sorted out. It is uh, by my watch. It is 2.15. We'll come back at 2.25. Does that suit everybody? Well, regardless. That's what we're going to do. Be back at 2.25. Phil, what do we do? Leave our mics off and phones off. Yes, okay. mics and videos off. You can certainly and turn your, mute, your, your microphones yeah. off and video if you wish. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
Okay. Now what are we doing? Producer Phil, are we good to go again? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. We're good. Just want to make sure Councillor Mason is with us. Is my video working now? Hello. Yeah. It Looks is. good. All right. Thank you.
What happened? Oh, it's terrible. It looks terrible. Okay, we're live, folks. Folks, we're going to continue the meeting. We're going to move to uh, item 8.1.4, which is proposed amendments to Administrative Order 14 respecting application of interest charges on outstanding accounts and Administrative Order 18 respecting revenue <coughs> collections regarding policy tax deferral. I have Council, uh, Deputy Mayor on this one. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I will move that Halifax Regional Council adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 14 respecting the application of interest charges on outstanding accounts and Administrative Order 18, the Revenue Collections Policy Administrative Order, as set out in Attachment 3 of the Staff Report dated April 2nd, 2020. I so move. Second, I can I can my witness. So, we realize that uh, that with uh, COVID-19, really, this has created an economic insecurity for many of uh, the residents and businesses of HRM. So it, it also has to be recognized that relief is going to have to come in a number of phases and from a number of sources, different orders of government in particular. So this really is meant to be our, our short term plan. This pushes out the due date for taxes to June the 1st and also lowers the interest rates for uh, people who are overdue come June the 2nd. And of course, the, the hope is that this will bridge the gap until a province wide solution is found because certainly a, a provincial uh, solution would be better than a patchwork quilt of different municipalities coming up with their their own solutions. So I do think that uh, Jane Frazier has a, a PowerPoint that she's going to share with us. Yeah, Jane, do you want to take it away? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Jane Frazier, Director of Finance, um, Asset Management and ICT. I have a very brief uh, PowerPoint to go through some of the points that the Deputy Mayor raised. Uh, next slide, please, Bill. Just one moment there, please, Mr. Mayor. Just trying to fix something. Okay. Good, Jane. Okay, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So it's actually it's quite soon to be um, trying to get a handle on the economic impact of COVID-19. Every municipality is is grappling um, with this and really trying to understand how deep the cuts are. Um, both to program as well as tax revenue. So there are a number of groups that have been um, convened, uh, both in Nova Scotia as well as through FCM. So work, working with um, the AMA and SFM as well as the FCM working group table. Um, the numbers are, are quite deep. I mean, the City of Toronto alone talks about $65 million a week in lost revenue. Uh, and, and looking at what that means for them, Virtually every big city is asking um, the federal and provincial governments for tax deferral. Uh, so we are uniform across the country in, in what the what the need is. And really the liquidity is the main concern. It's about being able to have cash come in to ensure that um, bills can be paid and, and payrolls can be met. Uh, municipalities are obviously reviewing budgets and service levels as well as reserve balances. And the concern is that if it goes too long, that all the cash reserves will be um, depleted. The possibility of ending up in uh, deficit is, is very real for all municipalities across the, the country. Um, and our general concern is that this is going to be a longer term impact and that it's going to ripple through the, account, the economy for uh, two to three years. Next slide, please, Bill. So the measures proposed here as, as outlined by, uh, by Deputy Mayor Blackburn are, are to provide immediate relief to impacted residential and commercial customers. 
delaying the interim uh, bill due date from April the 30th to June 1st gives residents and businesses that are most impacted time to access cash either through federal programs or provincial programs. The NSF uh, fee of $40 is charged when, when checks don't clear. Um, removing this really helps customers uh, that are experiencing a lot of financial shock. It just it removes a bit more financial uh, stress on them. Halifax Water has taken this step, as has the, uh, the city of Winnipeg. Reducing the interest rate from 15 to 10% um, recognizes the financial hardship many are facing and is one way that we can help our customers who are falling behind on payments. The cost of these measures are about $350,000 to June. And when we look at it over the year, it's $2.1 million. So there is a financial cost to these measures. So just digging in a little bit more on the financial impacts. Um, moving the tax bill date from April the 30th to June the 1st will cost about um, $100,000 in lost investment income. So that's money that we would have had in and would have invested. Um, so that's $100,000. Lowering the interest rate from 15% to 10% is $2 million annually. And that assumes that there's about, at any given time, $30 million of tax arrears outstanding. NSF check uh, revenue is $19,000. Um, $19, some other uh, lost revenue as, res as a result of COVID, um, and these are just estimates and certainly is not a complete list. Uh, transit fares, as you've heard, is about $3 million a month. Rec program is about a million. Uh, the sus suspension of parking fees, $450,000 um, a month. What's not included in these numbers are things like reductions in deed transfer tax, um, if the, ho the housing market slows. Uh, or lost investment income due to um, the volatility that we're seeing in, in stock markets or uh, any tax deferrals or, or missed payments. Next slide, please. The AMA and NSFM um, have conducted a survey to collect data of what other municipalities are doing. So there were of 50 municipalities, 46 uh, submitted the information and there's eight municipalities, including ourselves, that are moving the tax bill due date. Um, it's really hard to compare these because some only uh, do one tax bill a year. Some of them send it out in June or, or the end of August. Um, so you really can't um, use that to, to assess the impact on municipalities. It's more, more interesting than anything. Um, when we look across the um, across the uh, the country, uh, as I said, a number are taking the same measures that that we are, which is putting the due date out, uh, deferring tax sales, waiving NSF uh, fees. Halifax Water um, has uh, looked at deferring bill payments, water bill payments to July the 31st, uh, with no interest payments from March uh, 13th to July 31st. Um, and deferring bill payments. So a lot of a lot of um, programs and relief going on, uh, and obviously reviewing our, our budgets and service levels. So finance staff are looking at HRM impacts, and we've developed some budget scenarios. Um, the estimated impact of COVID for HRM is in the range of two hundred and twenty three million dollars. We estimate one hundred and eighty eight million of that is in tax deferral, and the balance is in lost revenue um, from. Uh, services and programs. Um, so that's sort of the the scope or the order of magnitude that we're that we're facing. Uh, next slide, please. This table um, just once again shows what the uh, comparable cities um, are doing across across the country. Um, it is once again, it's hard to to make a, a comparison of of which one's more aggressive or not because of uh, different legislative requirements, different due dates, things of, of that nature. Um, I, you know, one thing that that every municipality and, and all jurisdictions are are very firm on or or united on is that um, the communication is those that that can pay their taxes really should pay their taxes regardless of of what the uh, the deferred due date is. Next slide, please. So the longer term plan is to allow for a deferral of taxes for those that need it. Uh, as I said, people that can pay their taxes should pay their taxes. Um, working with the AMA and the NSFM, um, a letter was sent to the, uh, the Premier as well as the Minister of Business, Finance and uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing, and that's attached to the, um, to the staff report. 
essentially the back the ask was for the province to backstop uh, taxes that are owing and for people that qualify up to a maximum of 24 months. Um, the rationale for the timeline is to give people enough time to get their feet under them. Um, and this is businesses and, and people. We do know that this is going to be a longer term impact as it goes through the economy. Um, we have been in, in any communications we've had with the province on, on the program is that it, it's a deferral. It's not forgiveness. Um, and there is a cost associated to, to borrowing this, uh, to borrowing money. Um, and it, that will have to be passed on to anybody that uh, qualifies and takes, um, takes part in uh, a deferral program that, that may be stood up. Um, today we've had uh, three calls with the province on the approach. We have another one scheduled um, and the conversations have been positive. Um, I, I know the, um, the president of NSFM, uh, Mayor Mood, is uh, briefing mayors and, and CAOs on weekly uh, Wednesday calls about what's going on. Essentially, the conversations have been around four pillars. One is establishing a commercial line of credit uh, that municipalities can access. Uh, the other is using the Municipal Finance Corporation as that vehicle for, for financing, uh, looking at deferring uh, mandatory provincial contributions. And then the final uh, pillar is accelerating um, provincial payments uh, for those of them that receive uh, payments from, from the province. Um, with that, um, I've concluded my, my presentation. And I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, are you uh, good? Uh, yes, no further questions. Thank you. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, you know, whatever we can do to help individuals who are affected uh, by this crisis is important. Um, Ms. Fraser and I and, and a number of councillors had discussion uh, over the last couple of days about especially the, the interest rates. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm looking at small businesses in, in my own neighborhood and around the uh, city who are having all kinds of issues, you know, zero revenue coming in right now and, and as much relief as we can give as possible. And I know the there's a table in the report. And, and if you look online at some of the other cities and what they've been able to do uh, and, and the interest rate that they charge anyway, you know, it's a tricky thing because it's a fine balance between um, a, an incentive to keep paying your taxes when you can, but not punishing you when you're unable to. And looking at, at lower figures, I would have loved to have been able to come in at five, six, seven, eight percent. Uh, but unfortunately, when you look at the cost of, of capital to uh, businesses, uh, if they can borrow cheaper than, than um, you know, it would cost them to defer their taxes, uh, then that creates a real cash flow problem with us. So on the whole, um, I think where we're deferring, where we're reducing our own interest rate, which uh, you know uh, most municipalities aren't, um, and that this is just the first tranche, if you will. There's uh, more help coming if we can get the province and, and other municipalities on board uh, to help even more with those who, who really do need the help. And and I, I don't think it was mentioned, but you know in the report it talks about the program we already have for low income residents and and. The rate that they're charged is considerably, it's almost free in a sense because they're in a particular situation. So um, while I would love to be able to do more, I, I see what we're doing here uh, is, is, you know, hopefully uh, a great step in the right direction and, and hopefully we can do more with the province's help in the future. So I'll be supporting what we have here in this motion, uh, Mr. May. Thank you, uh, Councillor. I did mean to uh to thank Jane and her team. Um, the amount of work that's going on by finance and analyzing all this stuff is hugely significant. A lot of uh, the deputy mayor who's on some of the calls would be aware of that as well, that uh, just every day they're trying to figure out ways to help. And I think uh, this is a short term solution to allow us to come up with a longer term solution. So um, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a couple of questions for Ms. Frazier. Uh, you know, you, you referenced the three calls with the province and uh, another call coming up. Any indication where the, uh, when we might be able to hear from them what their decision is and what their plan is? Do you have any timeline? And the second question I have is, and I think you alluded in your presentation, you know, for those that can pay, especially our, uh, well, any of our citizens, whether it's uh, commercial or residential, they should pay if they can. So just to be clear, many, many people have of their taxes come out of their mortgage. So any deferral, that doesn't impact that. Could you clarify that, please? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the councillor. So the timeline with the uh, with the province is that some the province that's something that we we ask on on a regular basis, mm -hmm. um, in order to uh, to get that. So they're working um, as much as possible, gathering information. They're also obviously worried about. Um, cash flow and liquidity so you know we do have the deputy minister of finance on the deputy minister of um, municipal affairs and housing so it is a senior uh, senior table and and sort of looking at what all well it, the options are and really what impacts um, people the most your second question about um, mortgage payments yes we have uh, indications from the bank uh, that any that the mortgage payments tax payments collected by a mortgage will be submitted to us on april the 30th we run cash flow every day and look at it. So people are still paying their taxes, which is which is very positive. Um, so uh, so it will be it will be a crunch though. Well, I think it's just important, uh, Mr. Mayor, that to make sure residents are realize those that pay their taxes via their mortgage that uh, that is really business as usual, and so that they're not anticipating a change from that. Thank you, Ms. Fraser. I will be supporting this. I appreciate the work you and your team are doing on this, and I look forward to uh, what the province brings forward, hopefully in a in a timely fashion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Adams. Thank you, uh, thank you, Worship. And uh, just a couple things. Two two questions. One is, what is the likelihood of of, of us getting some uh, uh, interest free uh, help for residents? The first question, and I guess that's a it's a subjective question, of course. But uh, what are the chances? And the other is, who in the provincial government uh, ultimately decides what type, if any, relief package? Uh, we can count on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the councillor. So, on your first so, question, so, councillor Adams, yeah. was it was it that the province would give us interest-free money that we could pass on to the residents, or that we would stand up an interest-free um, program? You're I'm sorry, you're muted. Please. You're on mute, Steve. How's that? Good. Uh, what What is the likelihood of uh, of of HRMRS being able to provide some interest free relief to uh, to residents? Um, so, for us to do that, um, there is a cost of borrowing. I think we would look at the low income. Uh, people that that we have um, that program already has a very low the deferred. Um, program has a very low income rate. I think if we looked at uh, standing up a tax deferral program, um, we would not be charging uh, the interest rate that you would get on arrear. So for example, if there is a program and you make your payments um, back uh, over a 24 month period or something like that, we would charge what our cost of, of borrowing is. So we wouldn't be making any money, but we would not be, um, uh, it wouldn't be free is what the staff recommendation would be on that. On your, your second, on the, the borrowing from uh, the province being able to, uh, to actually tell us what, what we can do. On that, we have um, so we we now have the ability to borrow um, and get a line of credit from a bank, which means that we can, under the charter and the MA, MGA, looking at um, tax uh, relief, can set up a deferral program that we council has the ability to set their interest rate to set the repayments and things like that. So essentially, we would not be putting people into arrears the way we do currently. So there's a number of things that details that we need to work out um, behind that. I would point out that any program that is established would be based on eligibility criteria. So we are really helping those people and those businesses that need it the most. Councilor one, one last point, if I could, is that uh, who or whom, or what group or body or individual ultimately makes the decision as to what uh, we as a municipality can do? Uh, thank you. So uh, through you to the council, Mr. Mayor. So assuming that we have the legislative authority um, to do this, it would be regional council that would make the decision. And 
And that that legislative authority would be, do we need approval from the province to get that, or is it is it an interpretation? I'm not an, I'm understanding that part of it. So we haven't um, we haven't worked out all the mechanics behind this. Um, so there are a number of groups. So we're just really talking about about what it's going to look like. Ideally, it would be so much easier if the province came out and supported the um, the deferral program. That way, there wouldn't be any interpretation. Obviously, we're going to work with legal on this. I do believe that we do have the ability um, in, in quick conversations with, with John. I don't want to put him on the spot um, that we can establish our own interest rates and the payments, the way the payments come back on any um, any taxes once the bill is set. John, anything on that? Thank you. Well, I think that's right. Um, you know, uh, I hate, I don't like talking off the top of my head, but interest rate um, I think is in our discretion. But I would want to check back over that before we were to go too far on it. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Outhead. Uh, Jim, Councillor Outhead. Okay, that mute button. Sorry, Jane, I gave you a beautiful thank you on everything you've done in your team and you missed it. But, uh, it is appreciated what uh, what you're all doing and we never thought we'd be doing this a few months ago. So thank you. I obviously strongly support the, uh, the proposed deferral as a starting point, as others have mentioned. And I hope we can do more as, as we've all said with help from the province. Um, what I'm worried about is the hospitality industry, the tourism industry, small businesses, and the stats that came out recently that almost 45% of homes in Canada have had somebody either lose a job or have a, a, wage, a wage rollback. So almost half of homes in Canada have been hit in addition to still the small businesses and particularly those sectors that I've mentioned. Um, what wasn't clear to me, Jane, and, uh, and in Sean's comments was what, you know, well, it's, 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 it's too bad we can't do interest free, but let's let's uh, you know let's support moving down to 10% uh, from in, uh, from 15%. But then you said that if we were able to get a line of credit or to get help, that we wouldn't make money on the interest rate, and that we would probably turn on our or pass on our cost. So what I'm wondering is, and I would hope that HRM and with good negotiators like you, Jane, I hope that we won't be paying more than a point or two above prime. Which is uh, which is very low, and that's I would not want to see those who and I'm worried about those who just won't be able to pay at all. But those who do try and pay over 24 months wouldn't be paying any more than we're paying for the line of credit, if you will, to float them. Can you offer me a little bit of clarification and comfort on that, on the two different interest rates that have been discussed? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through to the councillors. That's um, my fault. I wasn't clear on my answer. So what we're doing for um, taxpayers that are currently in arrears, no. we would reduce the tax rate um, for them from 15% to 10%. Okay. So then if we stand up a tax deferral program, the way it, we're thinking is so your taxes, you don't have to pay your taxes for six months. Then at, after the end of six months, you make your payments based on, um, a, let's say, a 12, 24 month uh, payment plan. Right. For those six months that you don't pay any taxes, and then on the payment plan, that's when the lower interest rate would be. So whatever our cost of carrying the capital is or the cash, we would have, we would transfer um, that. We would recommend that we would transfer that amount over, and I can guarantee it's significantly lower than 10%. No, that, that's comforting, and I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood. Uh, the other thing, are you, you mentioned eligibility, so there's going to have to be some means testing or some qualifying qualifying for these sorts of things. So that's good to hear if you want to tell me a little bit more about that. The other thing is that are we starting to calculate almost, and I hate to say this, but I mean, there are going to be bankruptcies. There are going to be businesses that don't open. Are you and your team doing that sort of morbid discussion of what write-offs may take a spike? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to, to the councillor. So um, unfortunately, there will be some some businesses that do not um, do not survive, which is why we're, we're looking for, for that longer term. When we did a, an analysis of what we think the um, the 
the order of magnitude would be, how we came up with the 188 million. Um, we went through and said, okay, hospitality industry, they're hit, they're slammed. So their ability to pay is really uh, quite low. We looked at residential. We felt that based on, um, you know, the, the makeup, the demographics of HRM, there's a lot of, um, it's a government town. There's a lot of people are still working. Uh, and then there's more retired people that tend to, to pay their taxes. Um, so we took a 25% on that. So we are um, working at, at everything. On the uh, eligibility criteria, we do have the NSFM and uh, AMA have stood up a working group to figure out what it is. Originally, it was going to be um, going with the federal or provincial. Uh, anyone that's on their programs are receiving relief. We're a bit we're a bit concerned because their their programs are so broad and are looking at so many different things than just tax bills. Um, that they may not, they may either be overly generous or they may not be stood up in time for us to do our, our work. So we want to get out um, to make sure that we have something by by June. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Zorowski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Jane, for the, uh, the presentation and, and for the answers. Um, this is a very difficult uh, issue and when I look at this, five million Canadians have already applied for some sort of support based on the COVID-19 outbreak and it's hit us really quickly and hard and my, when we put someone's home at risk, um, it's, it's really serious and this looks like a once in multi-generational uh, kind of affliction that we have right now. We've, in my lifetime, never seen anything like this in the um, in half a century or more. Uh, so I, I feel that we have to uh, react a accordingly to that. Um, it's one thing for businesses to fail. It's another thing to lose your home and to become homeless based on on that, and I feel that uh, even though we're dropping interest rates from 15% to 10%, um, we're um, unlikely to be out of this COVID, and, and the Prime Minister has said as much uh, based on what Dr. Tam has been saying, that we're not going to be out of this. We're looking at multiple waves. Um, and HRM has, listening to what we were talking about before the outbreak, HRM has been doing very well. Uh, we've, we've got uh, very little in the way of uh, uh, negatives against our balance sheet and we've got a very healthy balance sheet, but the future is really uh, the area that, that we're uncertain about. And I, I feel kind of um, queasy about the interest rate. I think all we're doing is deferring things into the future where we still won't have a vaccine. Right now, the the vaccine is probably a year away. It probably will not be here, according to the best scientific estimates. And there are 70 different groups working on one right now. And they're all saying they probably won't have anything till 2021. And that means we're sort of go in, in the same position that we are right now. And I, I think that we have to look at um, what that means for us, like how many people are going to be in dire straits, how many businesses are going to fail, um, and for us to act accordingly, I would like to see a better interest rate, a much better interest rate, because even though it's going to hurt us and push us into a, uh, a negative balance sheet, it's a, a, us going to a negative balance sheet is a far sight better than someone losing their home. And that's what I worry about, that when people lose their jobs, and we do have a large service tourism industry here and, and, and a restaurant and students and universities, and they're really suffering. So is this really the best we can do? Because to me, it seems to be looking at the big picture and it's, it's definitely not a criticism. I have to defer to your expertise in this, but I feel that dropping the interest rate from 10% or from 15% to 10% is 
not going to do anybody any good. Jane? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's there's a lot in there. Um, so the first thing, tax if tax sales are a failure, um, in our opinion. So we have a number of programs that um, that if you're in tax sale that we can we can all that already exists that we can structure. Um, thanks. Just a sec, please. Sorry about that. One of the joys of working from home. Um, so, so we so we already have um, programs where if someone can't pay their taxes, that they come in and we arrange a payment plan, and it's not hooked on you know 24 months or whatever. We work with them to be able to do that. So that's the first thing. So we are looking at that. If we lower the tax rate too far, um, it will be cheaper for people to pay the bank than it is to, to pay us. And we absolutely need cash to come in. So in February, when we were doing the budget, we were talking about we're in good financial position. We had $250 million in the bank. We burned through cash at about $100 million a month. Um, and that's with, with all the revenues coming in. So our revenues are decreasing. Um, so we have probably enough cash to keep us for, for four months. Um, so that's some of the reasons that, that we're doing this. The other thing that, that we're trying to do is, is we need to um, make sure that as many businesses that come out of, come out of this as, as healthy as they can, um, which may only be 50% of, of operations, because we need to keep the economy going. What's going to happen next year is the assessment base is going to be lower, um, which means then, and we're also going to have less cash coming in because of tax deferral. So then we're going to have to put more pressure on, on taxpayers through, through tax rates. So it really is a delicate balance of keeping all of those, um, all of those things going together and, you know, underscoring that we don't know. We don't know what this is going to be. We do know that it's going to be long term. It's going to look go through the economy at, at quite a rate and that there's going to be cycles of it. So um, it's not perfect. It's uh, what I can tell you is it aligns very much uh, with what all the other big cities across the country are doing. Uh, it is a it would align with what the province from a provincial solution is doing. Um, but I fully expect that this is just the beginning of, of the process and we'll just keep our eyes on it and, and come back and, and do as much as, as we can. Mr. Mayor, am I out of time? You're at 620, so I'll have to have you come back. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Jane. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let me just, I think Councillor, I lost my list. Councillor Whitman, I believe, is uh, okay. next. Councillor Whitman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Jane. Thank you, uh, Councillor Adams and Outset. I agree with, uh, with your comments. Thank you, Councillor Zorowski, for your uh, comments regarding the interest rate on the uh, the tax deferral. I've heard from um, residents, both um, commercial and residential, from all over HRM on this, and uh, it doesn't seem like we're going to be able to do anything uh, good enough for the commercial properties. They're just not going to um, benefit enough from uh, this deferral proposal in front of us. But for the uh, residential folks, and you mentioned some folks are already in arrears before this tax bill, um, I'd like to amend the motion to uh, reduce the rate from 15% to 5%. Okay, uh, is there a second for that? Well, well second. go ahead, the council. Yeah, okay, so Kim here. Did I get a second? Kim here. I'm happy to second it. If no one else is Tim here. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Savage. You know, a lot of the decisions that have been made um, regarding the four million dollars or four point two million that we're losing monthly in revenue weren't made by this council. They were made before we were meeting virtually, and so parking revenue, recreation revenue. Um, transit revenue, those were all decisions made by the administration. And here's finally a chance that the elected body, the officials can uh, have an impact that shows that we're listening and that we care. And uh, th and that's why I recommend the 5%. Our, our cost of borrowing is under 5%. And to say that we're not gonna make money on this particular item, I don't wanna make money on this item. We've got $20 million that are pegged for the stadium and all kinds of other funds that we can put towards this. 
and there's nothing as important as our residents and then being able to pay their property taxes. So I thank you, Councillor Outhit, for seconding. I hope that my colleagues will, will uh, support this as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Traves? Um, yes, Mr. Mayor, just, just perhaps if the councillor could clarify, it, is there a time period for that? I think at some point there'd been some discussion of six months um, uh, reduction of interest. If, if there's going to be a discussion on this amendment, um, perhaps council would consider that um, uh, in the context of, uh, of a uh, six month period. Sure. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Traves. I was going to suggest at least the amount of time that we're talking about, the reduction from 15 to 10. I was going to match it, but if we want to talk about six months, I think that six months uh, is uh, more applicable for the size of the, uh, the catastrophe. Well, I just uh, perhaps get Jane's comment on the, on the length of period of time. Uh, thank you. I think, you know, certainly from a staff point of view, having a, um, a time frame on this would be uh, very helpful. Um, six months. So th this is only for those that are currently in arrears. Um, and uh, so if, if it's council's wish for six months, staff will certainly stand up a program that um, that addresses it that way. It will cost um, an additional $1 million um, in lost well, actually, it'll be more than one because the um, the amount of arrears will probably grow from 30 million to a higher number, and then it's the the lost revenue on that. So it'll probably be about a, a cost of 1.5 million dollars. Uh, thank you. I would settle for six months, although I'd be willing to go up to uh, 20 months for the amount of money we committed to the stadium. Thank you. Classy. Okay. Um, Thank I've you, Councillor Mason, for your support. Thank you, Wayne. Okay. Welcome. Got, folks, we speak one at a time here. Councillor Cleary, I've got you on the amendment. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, so I had, it's funny, because I had sent some information to our staff looking at uh, this sort of thing. Um, and the the trouble, and I'll, I'll, I'll actually maybe ask uh, Ms. Fraser to speak about this, but the trouble is if we offer a rate that is lower than what they can get elsewhere in terms of lines of credit or, or a loan, um, then essentially what they'll do is they'll just take out the loan somewhere else um, uh, or, or not pay us um, because <laughs> it's, it's cheaper to, to borrow and not pay taxes or to borrow to pay your taxes. So, the problem becomes cash flow for us. And um, as Ms. Fraser had explained earlier, this is just the first step that we are currently looking at with other municipalities across Nova Scotia, what, what else we can do. No one is gonna benefit from this tomorrow. Uh, reading the staff report, it doesn't come into effect until June 2nd, which is the day after we're pushing out the deferral for tax payments. The, the key here is to help, it's kind of like when you think about our low income programs, whether it's the bus pass recreation, the key is to target the assistance to those who actually really need it, not to just provide blanket assistance to anyone who actually doesn't need it. If, and, and Ms. Fraser's point earlier was, if you can pay your taxes, please pay your taxes. If you listen to the, the, the premier, if you listen to the prime minister, everyone keeps saying, look, we're sending you money through EI. We're sending you money through the CERB. We're sending you money through the 75% wage subsidy. We're sending you money uh, in the form of, of income assistance and in loan programs for business. And so what we really have to be careful of, and, and God God bless Councillor Whitman. I'm glad he, 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 he got there, but uh, the problem is, uh, if you try to do something a little too much, you may actually get a different consequence. Um, 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 Member of Parliament for the Valley, Scott Bryson, used to say all the time, uh, be careful of the law of unintended consequences. Uh, because when you do something as, as good as your intentions might be, the impact may be something very different. So I wonder if, I, if we could just get Ms. Fraser to speak to 
not only what would be the impact financially as a cost municipality, but what would be the impact to a particular business making a choice between paying their taxes and not paying the tax uh, as the interest rate we charge goes from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 to 5. Um, where is that line where someone would choose to pay their taxes or not pay the taxes depending on what our interest rate is? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the councillor. So it really, it comes down to what the cost of, of borrowing is for, for an organization or a business. Um, and it's really difficult to figure out how much um, everybody pays, but certainly um, businesses are paying more than 5% on commercial loans, um, especially if, if you're a small business that actually owns your owns the, the property. So what will happen, it, it, it comes down to a decision of, of who you're gonna pay and when. Um, so it will be, if it, if it costs less to pay us than the bank, they're gonna go to the, they're gonna pay the bank. So we will be left um, without having that cash come in, which means then uh, we have to borrow more on short-term credit, which then costs more for us. The other thing is we did, um, and I, I believe the CAO sent the, um, the information around, we did a jurisdictional review of what interest rates are. And, um, you know, 15% is in the ball ballpark. At 10%, we would be the same as, as Cape Breton. Uh, Fredericton's half a point uh, below, but they have some compounding monthly and things. So the rate that, that we're proposing is reasonable. Um, you know, it is based on that, the financial impact, um, you know, because what will happen is instead of $30 million in arrears, that will increase. And then we calculate the lost um, uh, revenue off that. So just to do it for one year, uh, well, even six months, I think to do it for six months, we calculated it would be a million dollars um, at a point in time where quite frankly, we're looking for $223 million um, in order to, uh, to remain liquid. Thank you, Ms. Fraser, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm, I, as much as I would love to support uh, Councillor Whitman's amendment, it, it just seems that it may not actually get the assistance to those who actually need it. We may want to wait just a few more weeks uh, for staff to finish their discussions and negotiations and see what program they can come back with a more targeted relief to businesses that really need it. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I guess my question to Jane is, when I first read the report, I kind of thought this was a short-term solution to we actually get direction from the province on what money is going to be available for what. And um, I don't know whether this actually helps us or not. I, I do see this as putting more of a burden on the people that actually can pay their taxes because somebody has to pay for this and i guess the hard part i have with it and councillor whitman's already said some may never pay their taxes well somebody's going to pay that tax and that's going to be the people that can pay their taxes so i'm having a real problem with this and i would sooner debate this when it was uh six months down the road not now, because uh, we haven't heard from the province on what direction they want us to go or anything. So I will not be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Zorowski on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I look at, at this from weird historic levels of indebtedness and before the COVID crisis, many Canadians were juggling what they were going to pay, whether they were going to pay the 30% in interest fees on their charge cards, whether they were going to pay their taxes, whether they were going to pay, um, you know, the student loans that they have, all of that stuff. And the COVID has pushed us over. And when I look at things, uh, I see that HRM has far more resources in order to pay its bills and to provide its services than the people who we represent, our constituents. Uh, many of them are overburdened already. And if they're in the position where if we put the interest rates down to 5%, that they're going to choose to pay their charge cards, well, that'll probably only be for a month. If they're in that dire straits, they're going to be declaring bankruptcy anyhow. I see our role as providing relief to constituents. I see 
the balancing of the books to be a very important part of what we do, but really the well-being, the social well-being, the stress, the losing your job, the threat of getting um, COVID itself or having a family person ill supersedes everything else. And so I'll support the 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 five percent cut. I, I I think it's the least that we can do because we have so many more resources available to us as a middle to large um, financial institute, as a municipality, than the individual does. And those who need the help need the help now, not six months down the road. Um, we have many constituents who are going paycheck to paycheck and they're finding their paychecks at this particular juncture to be a shadow of what it was before. So I would like to um, uh, support, and, and I will support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Mushak, were you trying to get in on this? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak. So you use the council and, uh, and uh, on this important topic. Uh, <clears throat> I would say it's it's rather premature to be making such a, a move at this point uh, to reduce the interest rate below, below what's being recommended. We are uh, going to come before council well before the end of May with a further uh, further thoughts and recommendations, not only in terms of where we are um, in our current fiscal situation to the end of, um, of our last fiscal period, but also uh, looking at our restated budget. Uh, we have uh, Jane and her team in my office and all the directors are working hard right now trying to trying to to uh, come up with a, a, a new budget uh, based on a lot of assumptions. Jane uh, mentioned, uh, you know, some shortfalls uh, well in excess of uh, $200 million that we're trying to wrestle to the ground. Uh, it's premature to take any uh, any further action, in my opinion, at this particular time, because we need, and I appreciate council and councillors want to help individuals, and so do I, and I'm sure everyone is, is appreciative of the fact that of the situation we're in. But uh, before we make any significant decisions that would have a, a long-term impact uh, on on our revenue streams, uh, we need to take a take a hard look at everything, and which is what we're doing right now, taking a look at everything, uh, taking a look at all the costs that can be deferred, costs that we can avoid, uh, and come back to you before the end of June, uh, or before the end of May, I should say, uh, with uh, further recommendations. It was pointed out that we have not completed uh, have, have, or have received a decision by the province yet. Those conversations are going well. Um, I'm optimistic that we're going to have some, uh, some solution going forward. Uh, however, uh, that's what the province, uh, the decision of the province will have to make, uh, given their understanding of, this, of the dire situation that all municipalities across Nova Scotia are in at the moment. Uh, and, um, you know, yes, I agree that our, our balance sheet was strong going into this, but as Jane points out, our cash uh, position uh, is likely only good until the, until the middle of August, at which time we'll be out of money. And, uh, and that is basically using the assumptions that we've been we've, we've been working on internally, including the recommendations that are before you today. So I'd urge you to work to adopt those recommendations uh, and allow us the time to make have a more fuller uh, analysis and, and appreciation and, and determine what recommendations we can bring forward to you before the end of May. Thank you very much. Now, see. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Traves, are you trying to get in on this too, or is that an old message? Okay. Councillor, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, you know, I understand where Councillor Zareski is coming from, but the, you know, we're actually trying to do three things, right? One is a general relaxation of our, our collection terms, uh, a softening of our position toward everybody with a tax account with us. And that's where we're talking about uh, pushing the tax deadline until June and lowering the interest rate. So that's one piece. The piece that helps the people that I think Council Zarelski is concerned about, uh, are concerned about, is the targeted support for people who have demonstrated need. That we don't want to be in a position where we're effectively loaning money to everybody, whether they need it or not, 
uh, at an interest rate lower than you would get from a bank or for, or, or from a line of credit. Uh, you, you don't you don't want to do zero percent interest or five percent interest because you want most people who are still able to pay to continue to pay. Uh, the targeted tax deferral still to be determined by the province for residential and business. Now, I would like to see that be 0% interest, though someone's got to pay for that. Is the province or the municipalities or is it going to be split? And it needs to be needs-based. It has to be for people who have uh, demonstrated that they've lost income. And even with federal supports and provincial supports, they can't pay their taxes anymore. Because as Councillor Cleary said, a lot of people are getting federal and provincial supports. And in many cases, they're going to be able to pay their taxes. So, and, and that was why those programs were created, was so people could stay on top of their bills. And we have to remind ourselves, and we have to remind people that a deferral is a deferral. It is not forgiveness. It means they have to pay it off eventually. So unless you're, this, the, we were talking about this earlier, uh, some of us were, were, were chatting earlier, uh, unless you're the savviest investor and you just think that you're amazing, you're gonna put a whole bunch of money into stocks or something, like basically most people should be, have one of their focuses be, if you can avoid getting into debt, don't go into debt. And then the third thing that we're talking about is forgiveness. And there are certain sectors in business, especially like hospitality, which Ms. Fraser talked about, are you know the hotels and the restaurants that may never be able to get back on top of the, all of their bills because they, their margins are super thin and they're not making any money for months. And, and they will be the last to reopen when this is over. Uh, but the way things work in Nova Scotia is forgiveness has to come from the province. We are not allowed to give grants. We cannot do targeted. So so they, they are responsible to pay their tax bill to us. We can defer that for a period of time, but if we want to write it off, if someone wants to write it off for the good of the province, that would have to be a program that would be administered by the province because we don't have the legal authority to do that. I think for the municipality, the most important thing we can do is try and find a way that we don't need a grant like the $200 million grant just to keep the doors open that Vancouver asked BC for. And I think that we're doing like what you hear from Jacques and Jane is we're doing all the right things that we need to support the targeted uh, targeted uh, deferral program. And, uh, and, and a big piece for us is to maintain services and make sure that when economic recovery starts, the city is here with the building permits out and the developments approved and the contracts out for paving and building stuff so that the economy continues to, to move. And that requires money, which is why we don't want to do a blanket tax uh, cut or a blanket push off and deferral of everybody's tax bill for a long period of time. I don't think that would be wise. So uh, I won't support the uh, motion on the floor and I won't need to come back to speak to the main motion. This is what I was gonna say then. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. I will also not be supporting the amendment. Um, one of the things that I look at when I'm paying my bills is I try and pay off the highest interest uh, bills first. And in this case, if 10% is the uh, highest interest bill, then that will receive a lot of attention. And I think we need to make sure that we keep the interest rate um, something that keeps it better but not 0%. And I, I think 5% uh, gets too close to zero. The other thing that I look at is it was mentioned earlier that I think it was Montreal uh, goes through $65 million a week. Um, when we look at uh, HRM going through funding, we go through 25 million a week, 100 million a month. And we can't afford to keep the city being operational if we incent people to pay other bills first. I, this virus is hard on everybody and, and, and I'm not diminishing that at all. I'm simply recognizing that we will need cash and I'm looking at all of the avenues that we have uh, cash coming in from. This 10% uh, is currently uh, slated to be effective on June 2nd. Um, I question for Jane. If we on June 1st say that we are willing to go down to 5%, um, how fast would it be before that can be implemented? Would it be another uh, few weeks, another month, another three months? Or would that be pretty much instantaneous uh, implementation? 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to, to the councillor. So because the interest rate is an uh, administrative order, we would have to do notice of motion. So that would have to be seven days before uh, when you wanted to, to put it in. So if that was um, a request, the intention um, by buying us some time to June the 1st is to come back with, with a deferral program that would have um, details laid out in it and so things like eligibility criteria how we're going to uh, target people what the uh, what the cost of borrowing is and what they would be paying um, as they go forward on on deferring uh, that's really what what we're trying to do so this really is um, a number of, of counselors have mentioned this is this is breathing room it's it's a stopgap until we can really get a better handle on on where we are um, and being able to, to help people that way. So minimum would be um, seven days uh, before we could have a report before council. And that's subject to John correcting me on that. Okay, thank you very much. And part of what this does by setting it at 10% is it also gives us the ability to carry on with the plan that has already been set out at 10%. And so for that reason, again, I will not be supporting the amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Othith. Um, thank you, Mayor. And uh, I was happy to support this because, uh, to second this, because we needed to have this discussion. And I've learned some things. Hopefully we've all learned some things. And uh, those listening and reporting on this have learned some things. I think it's right to have this discussion. I am willing to accept the advice from Jacques and Jane right now that we have a look at this uh, again, perhaps in a month or so when we have our uh, budget presentation and update towards the end of May, I believe you said, Jane, and uh, and uh, a little bit more information from the province. So glad we had this discussion. Stay the course for now, but I do think come early June we're going to have to have a discussion on any anything and all things are kind of going to have to be on the table. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, and I just want to like, there's been a lot of discussion here. I, I'd just like to go back over just exactly what this motion is doing. And it, it says that uh, the interim tax bill is going to be deferred until the 1st of June, which gives uh, May really is as a, as a period of a deferral. Is there interest going to be charged at that uh, during that one month if people choose to pay their bills a month later? Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. So if, so that assuming this passes, tax bills will be due on June the 1st. So for the month of May, but so for the month of May, you are not in arrears because the bill is not due. Okay, okay, that's 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 great. And Mr. Dubé also said that uh, we'll be coming back with a report in May. So before the, the first tax bill is actually due. So uh, this amendment, really is only going to deal with those that are in arrears at this particular time. Is that right? Okay. So although uh, I appreciate the spirit behind the amendment uh, and I would have supported, but we're coming back in, uh, in uh, this uh, tax bill is due to, to come up with, I would suggest a whole suite of, uh, of measures and I'll, I'll wait to that point. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor uh, Nickel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I guess, you know, I would agree with Councillor Adams. He just spoke before me, but I'm, I'm still like we we having these virtual meetings. We don't have the beauty of the clerk's uh, amendment before us. So I'm not I heard. So what it's saying is reduce the interest rate charged on late payments from 15 percent annum to five per annum. I think that's what I heard. And it's specifically for everything like but my question is, and I agree with Councillor Dubay, and I'm glad to hear uh, Councillor Dubay, Mr. Dubay, that he's going to come back with the budget because I also heard in the amendment that this is about the stadium. The stadium is a budget discussion, and at what point in time will we be reviewing that budget? Because right now, this is the first step. This is, I'm, I'm in agreement with it, but the amendment is basically taking a budget item into play at this point in time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the uh, councillor. So our plan is to be back with the uh, the recast budget. Uh, the last council meeting in May, I think we have it tentatively 
we're working towards uh, May 19th for finalization and then in front of council. And that would be the time that I would want to see the full picture as to where we are at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Whitman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage, and uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, thank you, Jane. Thank you to uh, staff for making a whole lot of tough decisions before we uh, began meeting again regarding transit and uh, rec fees and uh, free parking. And uh, you can see uh, doing it on your own is much easier than doing it with us. I feel like the reduction from uh, 15 to 10 and uh, my proposal of down to five is like a uh, an episode of Goldilocks. Uh, 15 is too high, five is too low, and 10 is just right. So to my colleagues, uh, thank you for uh, for picking the middle one. Um, I hope you'll be able to support me and uh, support our residents that are in need. Uh, otherwise, um, I will be supporting the uh, the main motion if my amended motion does not pass. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak on that? I've got some names, but I think it's on the main motion. Councillor uh, Smith. Uh, main motion, Councillor Smith, or amendment? Main motion, please. Thank you. Okay, ready for the question on the amendment? Call for the question. Let's call question. the roll on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Stretch. Thank you, and although I appreciate the sentiment, I'll be voting against the amendment. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Carston. No. Councillor Nickel. No. Councillor Austin. Opposed. Councillor Mancini. No. Councillor Mason. No. Councillor Smith. Against the motion. Councillor Cleary. Nay. Councillor Walker. Against. Councillor Adams. Against. Councillor Zorowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. A classy yes from me. Councillor Russell. Against the amendment. Councillor Russell. Oh, sorry. Councillor Outhit. No for now. Hey, you forgot me. I know. Deputy okay. Mayor Blackburn. <laughs> uh, sadly, I must vote no. Mayor Savage. Opposed. So that is 15 in favor and 15. Two in favor and 15 against. Was it two in favor or? Th yes, three. Councillor Hensby and uh, Councillor Whitman. Zorowski and Whitman. Councillor Zorowski and Whitman. Councillor Zorowski was in favor. Yes, yeah. and Hensby? Okay. Hensby, you were in favor? Yes, sir. Yeah, so three, 14 to three? Yes. Okay. The motion is defeated on the main motion, colleagues. I have Councillor, I think Councillor, uh, let me just have a look at this. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and great discussion from everybody. So really quickly, uh, if this passes, the next steps, so we have an idea of the timelines, but how will the communication happen to residents and businesses when, if, if this passes? And what's the plan for the communication? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillors. So there's a, a, pub, a PSA that's ready to go, uh, assuming that this uh, passes notifying people of the new tax bill due date. We'll be putting things up on, on the website. We'll be changing front end messages. Um, so they'll be uh, working with Brett and his team. Um, a, comms, a comms plan and, and the CAO has already um, asked uh, corporate communications to, to stand that up. We also will be reminding people that if they can pay their taxes, they should pay their taxes. So will you be mailing out another notice that would have a different um, due date or will, will they still have, what will happen? 
Um, through you to, to the councilor, no, we will not be doing that. Um, it's very labor intensive and very expensive to do that, right. and especially with delivery not occurring. Um, so we will be pushing the message uh, through social and through uh, any other any number of, of means, as well as, as print and, and things like that, and on our um, web page on the banner. So somebody says that they, for some reason, um, didn't get the messaging and would have rather been able to take advantage of, of what we're proposing. What happens then? So you mean that they paid their they paid right. their bills and they didn't? Um, I think we would do that on a case by case basis. Okay, councillor. Cool. So um, there will there will. Okay. All right. So that that's it for me. Thank you very much. Good thank job. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to just say a, a couple of words, if I could, uh, on this topic. Um, I won't step out of my chair on this occasion. Uh, you understand. Um, so the one thing that's missing in our conversation here today, I think, is the federal government. And uh, as Jane knows and Jacques knows and Bill would know, uh, Councillor Karsten would know, there's a lot of discussions going on with the federal government as well in terms of backstopping some of the, the issues that we, that we have. Uh, the big city mayors have had a number of conversations and Bill's been in those. Um, the Deputy Prime Minister has been very involved in those discussions, as has Minister uh, McKenna. Um, from my point of view, there's a very easy way of helping out municipalities because they have a gas tax that is a proven formula for getting money to municipalities. The criteria would likely have to change if it was to support COVID-19. And we don't know what's going to happen, but the conversations have been very positive. And um, uh, I think um, I think it'd be very constructive. Um, I spoke to Mayor Clark in Cape Breton this morning. Uh, they're going through the same issues, of course, that we are on a different scale. And uh, we have certain costs, they have certain costs. Transit in both cases is a provincially designated essential service. It's the kind of thing we would look to perhaps have some support from the province on uh, as well. Um, but I do think that at the end of the day, we're going to need the province to step in and to backstop us, uh, whether it's through the Municipal Finance Corp or some other measure. And uh, I'm pretty convinced that uh, we pass this today, we come back and we'll be able to uh, specifically help those who actually need the help that as opposed to a scattergun approach that this would actually be able to target the people most in need and jane had mentioned colleagues that you know if we go into debt on this um we, we would need the province to allow us to pay it back over a period of time you know our tax base next year is going to be significantly less because it's based on the value of the commercial properties particularly uh, most of whom or a lot of whom aren't drawing any revenue so that's going to have an impact for us next year jane i think it's Fair to say, correct? Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. I mean, that is that's one of the big concerns is what's going to happen to the to the tax base. So not only are we going to have to uh, pay off some of this, and we have to take on our share, uh, but we're going to have a uh, a diminished base from which to deal with. So um, it's a bit of a challenge. So I don't see any other names on the board. Anybody else? Uh, or maybe I, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I do see some. Are there, is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this at this point? I, yes, Mr. Hey, Councillor Karsten. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Jane, uh, and, and your team for all of the work you've done on, on this so far. And I know that uh, your work with the province continues and your work with uh, the FCM uh, CFOs continues as well. Uh, my question is a direct question in regards to, do you have a copy of the slides in front of you, Jane, or can you? Can you get them or you probably know it verbatim. Uh, I'm talking about the last slide. And that's the provincial proposed provincial program. One I have it, thank you. Okay, okay great. Uh, so and, and it sort of goes with what the mayor is saying in terms of, uh, yeah, there's a direct hard push uh, on the federal government for funding uh, to backstop the losses that municipalities are incurring. Uh, across the country and the last bullet in, in that page on that uh, slide says, uh, well, I'll read it, request that uh, the provincial government provide a line of credit to municipal for municipalities to ensure continued service to taxpayers. Is that primarily uh, based on, is that directly related to, again, a tax deferral program or are you talking about backstopping other costs, lost revenue as well? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. So there was some um, different interpretations about the ability for municipalities to borrow um, from financial institutions for a line of credit. credit. So this actually does two things. One, it clarifies that, um, that that authority exists. So that's the first thing. The second thing that it does, which is, is more important for, for municipalities, it's looking at the Municipal Finance Corp um, as that that vehicle so that you know you don't have a number of different municipalities having to go out to borrow at commercial rates they may not be able to um, some of the smaller municipalities may not be able to um, to access cash so by having that line of credit um, it allows us to get cash to come in just to to meet payroll and, and to keep the economy going thank you for that clarification uh, that fills the gap that I was missing thank you Councillor Hensby. Councillor Hensby, did you have a... Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question was more about uh, tax sales. You guys made a reference to, you know, tax sales is a failure of not being able to collect taxes or pay through taxes. But through this whole uh, pandemic uh, deferral and everything, will there be an opportunity or will our tax sales be deferred indefinitely? And will the interest rate be also the same on those tax sale accounts? You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's taxes now owing uh, for current taxes, but what about the previous taxes? Are they going to be calculated on previous year's interest rates or based on what's being proposed here today? Uh, so, and also, will there be an opportunity for perhaps um, an extension of tax sales in regards to some date in the future? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the councillor. So, on tax sales, um, we were scheduled to have one. I think the third week of fourth week of March. Um, that's been postponed. I think there's one coming up in September. We expect that will be postponed. We are working with legal um, in order to figure out like what the proper mechanism is to postpone um, tax sales because under the legislation, I think it's within three years, you have to put them up. So we will be deferring um, tax sales and working with legal on that. So there will be a report coming. The change in interest rate is a go forward um, based on uh, the report today. So the interest, uh, the tax arrears interest owing currently will not be changed or will not be adjusted. And I don't believe that we have the ability to go back and, and do that. Well, Mr. Mayor, I just want to say thanks to the staff. And since my initial email to everybody back on March the 18th in regards to requesting this to tax deferral on property taxes, this must be one of the fastest staff reports I've ever seen come back to council. And thank you very much, Jane, and all your staff and compiling all that information. Very thorough, very informative. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Outhead. Thank you, Mayor. It sounds like we have a woodpecker on council here today, yeah. I'm not sure. Where that's coming from? Must be from Just, uh, Jane, I think you mentioned this that uh, the vote to defer will be passed this today, a PO to clean. I have a request. Obviously, we don't see the PSA still just, but could we please explain in the PSA that this is just the beginning, if we haven't done that, just moving the date from April the 30th? Till June the first is, and, and you know, people are looking for and expecting more than that. And let's not just send out a PSA saying that we're changing the date, but could we let them know that we're looking at other things, working with the province, waiting to hear from the province, etc. A little bit more communication so that we don't get a thousand so what's. I need more. Um, and perhaps Jane, you know, if there's more included in it than that, but we can't count on people having watched the session and they need to understand what we're doing and why. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. I'm oh. saying Jacques may want to speak to that uh, as well, but you go ahead, Jane, if you wish. What I was going to say actually was that there will be a number of different communication channels, and I was actually going to uh, turn it over to the CAO to speak about some um, press briefings and, and other vehicles that, that they're using. So I'll turn it over to uh, the CAO. Jacques, you with us? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Yuzu, Councillor Outhead. Uh, yeah, we are uh, we are in crisis communications mode, obviously, and uh, we're using many many channels to get our message across: uh, press briefings, PSAs, uh, information on our website, uh, through our Twitter account, through our Facebook account, and all that. So we'll be using all of those. Uh, I would re I'd be reluctant to uh, put out a PSA or or talk about uh, in too great a detail what 
kind of a conversation we're having with the province or our partners at this point, but uh, we can certainly put out some high level uh, messaging on that. Um, I wouldn't get into a lot of detail, but I would certainly want to ensure people that we're working collaboratively with the province and uh, we're, we're, we're going to have, be having some conversations with the federal government at a high level as well uh, this week uh, as, and, and uh, going forward as well to the mayor and uh, many of you, including Councillor Carson and, and uh, deputy ministers, etc. So uh, yeah, we're uh, we're moving on that front and uh, appreciate council's patience on this and, and residents' patience as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean. And just quickly, Mayor, I, I wasn't expecting to go into a whole lot of detail, but I just don't want people to get the impression that referral is the beginning, not the end of a story. We could just put some language around that, that this is a phase one, a part one, whatever. Uh, that, uh, that, that's what I'm more concerned with, without you getting into too much detail on negotiations, which I respect. Yeah, fair. That's fair enough, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly uh, we'll, we'll certainly make that point in our communication that this is uh, an interim measure. And we're doing a more fuller more fuller analysis and have more complete uh, and, and uh, further recommendations for council to uh, consider once we have the full financial picture before us. Thank so you, Jacques. Thank, yeah. thank you. And that's been the message. Um, uh, Jacques, that we've taken at press briefings that as soon as this notice of motion came to council a week and a half ago, that this was a first step towards uh, finding a uh, solution for residents. Councillor, Councillor Whitman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Question for Jane, follow up on the main motion. Um, on the other side of the balance sheet, can you talk to us about some of the savings that we're uh, incurring right now over cost of gas and diesel and electricity to uh, you know, light and heat rec centers and staffing savings on that side of the balance sheet, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to, uh, to the councillor. So obviously that's some of the work that we are doing on um, uh, for the recast of the budget. We are looking, uh, so for example, we're estimating about a 28% savings on um, gas and diesel. That's just uh, on cost alone, so it doesn't take in, in volume. Um, we are seeing, uh, looking at, at basically, we're, we're looking at everything. We're looking at things like conferences. People are not traveling. We're looking at um, rec programming because we're not allowed to have uh, recreation programs on. It is still very, um, it, it really is, I've said this a couple of times, it's a fine balance between keeping work going so, for example, going out and doing some repairs in uh, facilities that are closed to keep the economy going, because we do we do need to keep paying our vendors and making sure that the work's there, so it doesn't just become a vicious um, spiral. So we are keeping some some things going um, and using opportunities there, but we have looked at the um, at the savings and looking at um, a number of of areas. The, uh, so that's all the fine tuning that we're doing. Sorry. Thank you for that. And uh, just a quick follow up. You mentioned paying vendors, so there won't be any impact if vendors are getting paid uh, impact on the service they provide. What we're paying for is what we will receive. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Great. So it's it's, the, you know, it's good. It's, it's going in and fixing things. It's potholes, that sort of thing. Absolutely. We're only paying for what we receive. Great. That's great news. Thank you. Thank you. OK, are we ready. I see nobody. Anybody else that want to speak on the main motion? Let's call the roll on the vote, uh, Cheryl. Councillor Stretch. Uh, for the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Kirsten. For. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Uh, for the motion. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yay. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. Yes on the main motion. 
Deputy Mayor Blackburn. I vote yes on the main motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outit. For the motion. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. 17 in favor. Motion passes. Uh, colleagues, what should, you'd like to take a break? Uh, colleagues, why don't we take a, it's quarter to four. Why don't we come back at four o'clock? Okay, we'll, just, we'll come back at four o'clock. Thank you.
Looking good, Mary. You still have that halo above you. <laughs> How are things in Bedford, Timothy? Oh, they're, you know, keeping me. Uh... I'm just going to remind counselors that you are being recorded. But I better not tell them what they really look like then. True. Dog looks good, Johnny. Almost as nice as uh, Obed. Okay, hey folks, are we, are we good to go? I think so. Bill, was that you? I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'm, we're ready to go on this end. Okay. Then I think we'll continue, folks. Uh, we'll go to um, motions coming out of uh, Council 8.2.1, Council Nickel, protecting registered heritage properties affected by development. The Councillor... Nicole. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will put the motion for Regional Council to consider and hope will approve that Halifax Regional Council request the staff report rec with recommendations in support of protecting registered heritage properties when they are affected by development by considering the following items. One, that a heritage impact statement as defined by HRM bylaw H200 be required in support of any discretionary planning application on site plan approval application that includes or abuts a registered heritage property and two, that heritage impact statements submitted to the municipality as part of any planning or heritage application be signed by a heritage professional as recognized by the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals. So I will wait Mancini. for a seconder. Second by Second. Mancini. Seconded by Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Nichols. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. And I will just finish reading the motion memo that everyone should have in front of them. But the reason for this is HRM should look at making heritage impact statements a requirement for development applications in the future for that in that process with costs that possibly being incurred by the developer and ensure that these statements are completed by a qualified heritage professional. The outcome sought is a staff report, of course, with more information and clarification with recommendations in support of protecting registered heritage properties when they are affected by development and stipulate the required qualifications for those submitting required documents. So I ask for your support. This is just basically trying to be proactive and getting all the information before us that we need to make you know, the determinations and the recommendations as they come and, and it has their impacted with development. Okay, thank you, Councillor Nickel. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. In regards to this, I was just kind of wondering uh, if this goes to a staff report, will it also go to the Halifax Advisory uh, Committee on Heritage Properties? You know, I'm a member of the Halifax Ad uh, Heritage Advisory Committee. Um, I want to know if the committee, committee is going to have any opportunity to dialogue on this, on this particular request. Councillor Nickel, anything on that? I would defer that basic. Basically, I think it would come to regional council and then we could have it go to the Heritage Advisory Committee. At this point in time, we don't have the recommendations before us. And so that would be up to the clerk's office as well. All right, Councillor uh, Whitman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage, and uh, thank you, councillors. Question for staff to respond to. Um, the last time we had a heritage um, public uh, public meeting there were 17 properties uh, on the docket 
Um, all 17 were third party uh, heritage designations by HRM. And I think that all 17 were um, voted down. I'm just wondering what uh, impact this would have at a um, one of those heritage uh, public meetings. If staff could respond to that, please. I don't think we probably don't have staff on for uh, notices of motion that would have to be did, taken account of, I think, in the staff report. Jock, are you there? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, this uh, this would be brought back. Any questions like that would be included back in the staff report to inform council as we go forward. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Whitman. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else on that? Question? Question. Ready for the question? Let's call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Naturally, yes. Councillor Austin. Uh, I'm for the motion. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm still on mute. It's acting. Mm -hmm. You're fine. We got you. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yay. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. I'll support the motion. Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outen. For the motion. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. I think that carries 17. Oh, oh. yeah. Thank you. Uh, 8.2.2 .2 is Councillor Hensby, Municipal Parkland Definition Boat Launches. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. I'll put the motion on the floor uh, that Health Actors of Council request a staff report to review the definition of municipal parkland with consideration of boat launch infrastructure throughout the municipality not be deemed parkland as per bylaw P600 respecting parks. All right, second. Second. Second, second, Whitman. Second for Councillor Whitman. Councillor Hensby. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. This request comes from a, a request that I got from some constituents wanting to know if they could have access to their to their summer homes. If they right now with the ice coming out of the lakes, they want to know if they're allowed to go access the, uh, the to their summer cottages to go get them cleaned up for this for the summer and stuff. They want to site, use their downtime during the site self isolation to go out and do this work at their at their camps and cottages. But the problem now with the definition uh, with parklands, any use of our municipal infrastructure such as boat launch, they'd be ticketed for it. We're concerned about that. Also, with the sport fishing season only delayed till May the 1st, we haven't heard of the problems with extending it or not. So if we have a sport fishing season starting within a matter of weeks, a couple of weeks, will the people using those boat launches also be a violation of the so-called uh, closure of municipal parkland? So I think that our boat infrastructure should be classified differently. Um, so that's why I want to bring that particular motion forward. Uh, I know there's been some social media discussions already about it. Should we or shouldn't we? The question is we need some clarification on, the, on some of our properties. Uh, I've heard some of the similar discussions about trails. Why are our trails part of the parkland definition? So if we need to go into our bylaw P600 to refine definitions, I think uh, trailways uh, and um, and boat launches should be perhaps reclassified to a different definition. But again, that the province still wishes to extend its uh, moratorium on the use of the public infrastructure, be it parks, uh, be it trails, be it boat launches, they can still do so. But in the meantime, right now it's a catch all basket. Okay, thank you, uh, Council. I have Councilor Cleary first. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> so actually, I'll just deal with um, what Councillor Hensby talked about trails. So that's been worked out. I mean, any trail that's outside of a park 
has already been uh, deemed open by us, you know, the Chain of Lakes Trail and, and, and other trails that we have. But we don't have the ability to overrule the province, and, and they said parks are closed. So if the trail's in a park, it's closed. As it relates to these boat launches, you know, Dr. Strang and, and the Premier have been quite clear. They've asked people not to go to their cottages. Um, if you need to access your cottage by a boat, that means it's fairly remote. My concern would be, of course, if all of a sudden people out there start filling up at their very remote cottages that you can only access by boat, if any of them, because of this close contact, end up with COVID, that will put undue pressure on our emergency services personnel. We're going to have to go rescue these people by boat, by helicopter, by whatever means. So um, I'm not, yeah, I appreciate that there may be people out there that are inconvenienced by a pandemic and, and want life to be as normal as possible. The unfortunate thing is we're in the middle of a pandemic. So um, these are classified as park land. I, I think they would certainly fit the definition. And Dr. Strang mentioned, uh, if not today, yesterday, that you know, if if we can crest this curve and finish this first wave, that there might be the opening up of, of more green spaces. And if the province decides to open up parks at that time, then 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 have at her. But I'm not really sure this is beneficial either from a municipal point of view, from a provincial point of view, or from a fighting a pandemic point of view. So I, I certainly won't be supporting uh, Councillor Hensby's motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to build on what Councillor Cleary just said. You know, it's been quite clear from Dr. Strang, uh, from the Premier, from our own Mayor, that we have to stop looking for loopholes. We all play a role in flattening the curve. And you know, I'm frustrated, you know, with my, my colleague, Councillor Hensby. You know, he's wanting ATV riders to have access to trails. We want uh, churches to have services and parking lots, uh, public boat launches, people going to the cottage. Uh, we all play a role. And, you know, we need to think, if not about ourselves, we're all inconvenienced in all this. We need to think about uh, those uh, most vulnerable, our seniors, which includes my mom who's 96 in a home, which I haven't seen since the whole thing started, which includes the, uh, the homeless, which in, in includes the working poor, and the list goes on and on. So we're all inconvenienced. Stop looking for loopholes. Let's follow the direction from public health, and let's stay home. Uh, the, and so we can get back to it. Councilor Zorowski talked about the financial pain it's going to cause to many of our residents, and so we need to stay home and stop looking through the loopholes. So I will not be supporting this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor uh, Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I agree with the uh, previous two speakers. Uh, you know, my dad contacted me three weeks ago and said, uh, can we go to the cottage? And I said, well, Dr. Strang just said, you shouldn't go to the cottage. You should stay home. And then he said, why? Because you're going to want to run out and get groceries when you get there. You're going to need, you might need to get gas. And every contact is a potential bit of work that public health has to track down if there is community spread. So we have actually been told not to go to our cottages. So why the Halifax Regional Municipality would enable people to go to their cottages, it's beyond me. I can think of 43 really good reasons why we're not gonna do this today, I hope. And they are the 43 people who were announced today to have COVID, right? Just in the last 24 hours. Uh, in addition to the no cottages, pr the premier said, stop looking for loopholes as, as councillors have already said. So why we would create a loophole, I don't know. I, you know, the, the, the bottom line here is, you know, I understand where Councillor Hensby is coming from. He's got some some community uh, reps, some community residents who want uh, uh, these changes to convenience them. But the answer I would urge you, Councillor, is to say to them, country or city, rural or urban, everybody has to stay home. That's what we've been told to do. Stay home. None of us like staying home. All of us have to stay home. So I will not be supporting this. Councillor Whitman. Thank you, Mayor Savage, and uh, thank you, Councillor Hensby, for listening and representing your constituents. Um, I'll be supporting your request for a staff report so that HRM taxpayers can access the HRM properties that they're paying HRM property tax on, unless one of my colleagues wants to suggest that these folks get a break on their property tax bill that they cannot access during this time. I'll be gladly supporting the request for a staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and uh, I too all will be supporting this because if indeed 
uh, province deems it inappropriate or wrong, then uh, they will uh, put this forward. Uh, I use Terrence Bay as an example. Um, the boat launch is not part of the park. Uh, there's separate pits, there's uh, separate designations. Uh, this, if nothing else, will uh, at least, um, I guess, uh, clarify any misconception. So, and if the province deems this uh, inappropriate, then they will step in quite quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, I, uh, I will not be supporting this. Um, COVID-19 sucks. It's disruptive, it's inconvenient, but it's the reality. And as we speak right now, Dr. Strang is actually on TV talking about what our future looks like if people don't abide by the guidelines. And, you know, we have a choice to make and each and every one of us has that choice. So I think it's time that we just pull on our big girl pants and do what needs to be done and stay the blazes home, just like the premier and Dr. Strang has, has they've told us. Um, and, and that means, unfortunately, you might miss out on the cottage. And, and Dr. Strang was very clear. He addressed summer cottages directly last week and said, uh, he, he realizes that there are people who want, uh, who are itching to get out there and clean out their cottages and get going for the season. But he said, you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait until June or maybe later. So, uh, you know, with, uh, with that, uh, information, uh, I'm definitely not going to be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, uh, Stretch. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you uh, to Councillor Hensby for bringing this forward. Uh, this is a difficult one, and uh, you know, it's no different than what we faced out here in uh, the Muscovite Valley, and I referenced this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, locals have properties and uh, they want to be able to use them as, uh, as they, uh, they see fit. The problem is there's a lot of folks that come into the community that don't uh, necessarily live in that particular community. And that's where a lot of the apprehension in my area was uh, uh, was coming from, uh, whether they stop at the store on the way or stop for gas. So I, uh, I'm going to find it very difficult to even support uh, a report on this because I think it is clear. And I think uh, for the greater good, we all at this particular time have uh, got to uh, uh, adhere by uh, what we're being uh, told to do by health and uh, err on the side of caution. So unfortunately, uh, I'll have to vote against uh, this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zorowski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Huh. So, I'm going to put my science hat on. They're telling us that 50% of the population before this is through is going to be afflicted with COVID. And so that means, just looking at Council, there'll be eight of us, excluding the Mayor who gets a buy on this, um, that will come down with COVID and out of that one of us will be seriously affected and may even die from this before it's all through. This is not a drill. The, the virus is a ghost. It's invisible. You don't know where it is. You can't determine who has it at this juncture in the ways that we need to. So, um, the science tells us it's foolish to play with the statistics, to play with the, I would like to go out, I'm going to take a chance, I'm not going to wear a mask, I'm going to walk through the park, I'm going to break in um, a different set of rules. I am weary of talking about the science that is so obvious and it's a deadly science, so I will not support this. I am sure there's pressure, and we're getting it from everyone who wants to get out on the trails, but it's ludicrous in light of the cost. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Karsten. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So thanks for the conference or discussion that's been held so far. I certainly will not support it as well. Uh, to Councillor Zorowski, I would suggest that uh, Councillor, I'm not going to put my science hat on, but I will follow Councillor uh, uh, Blackburn's lead 
and, and put my big boy pants on, okay? Uh, so I, I can't support this. Look, uh, it's very, very clear. I mean, we've had that conversation that parkland is closed. Uh, I think the, the other point I would raise is uh, Councillor Hensby may not have picked up on the fact that uh, from what I understand, and it was only again through the media, but uh, I understand that uh, uh, public health has also closed the sport fishing season this year. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's it's not something I'm going to support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, not to belabor the point, uh, I think it's been well made by colleagues about loopholes and needing to take the direction of public health right now. Uh, Dr. Strang and the Premier have been very clear on this. The point I just wanted to emphasize, um, and Councillor Stretch went there on this as well, um, I, if memory serves today in the news, it's the 43 new cases are all here basically in Metro. They're all in the central health region. Um, what, if, if we're going to just say giving out these mixed messages about going to the cottage, basically it's an invitation to potentially export COVID out of the core here into even more rural communities across the province that might be fortunate enough not yet to have had a significant exposure. We all need to stay home and uh, taking this on right now would be really going against that message, so I can't support it. Thank you, Councillor uh, Nickel. And I'm not going to also belabor it, but at the end of the day, I'm still stuck on the 43 cases and it is growing and to Councillor Austin's point, you are going to be expanding it. We were, we've asked several times when all the, you know, the trails and the parks were closed, how if we could revisit that, if the province would even consider it. It was a steadfast, hard, fast no. So I'm not going to explore looking, even if it is just for a staff report, because it's opening that gate and where do we where do we stop? And I said it at the beginning and I'll say it again, stay home. Thank you. Anybody else on this? Yes, to Mr. Mayor, wrap up if I may. Councillor Hensby. Well, thank you very much, colleagues, for your conversations and, and the comments. Uh, like I said, I was bringing this forward on behalf of constituents who would make the request. Uh, they didn't want to violate the law by, by parking at a, at, a, at a boat launch and getting ticketed. They wanted to know what clarification there was and was considered park plan or not. I, I did, as we're all elected to do, required to do, is bring concerns of constituents forward, which I've done. Uh, the only question uh, to clarify for Councillor Carson, the province only postponed the sport fishing until May the 1st. It's not cancelled yet, only postponed. Also, private campgrounds are also closed till May the 1st. So we're waiting for the province to come back and said, are they going to extend that uh, deadline? I anticipate they probably will. But uh, as I said in my motion, you know, if the province wishes to uh, decree uh, boat launch is also closed, the marine is also closed, uh, then so be it. But, but that's not been clear in the public health orders or, in the, or state of emergency orders. So the question, that's why I want to have clarification. We talk about the trails we've seen here in New Brunswick, that where they opened up the trails back again, but made a one-way one -way, uh, traffic corridor is for, for active transportation, because they didn't want the close interaction of people uh, confronting or, 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 or passing someone. So they adjusted their, their, their ways of using trails. But I'm just saying is that I'm not looking for loopholes. I'm just asking for clarification. So. And if I could put a wall around uh, Metro and keep the, keep the virus in Metro, so be it. But I can't do that. I don't have the authority uh, like Trump or somebody else. But I'm just saying is that uh, it was just a request to a constituent. I just brought it forward and I thank you for your comments. And I'll, uh, if you wish, I might as well uh, retract the motion. If, it, if it's, I know it's not going to pass, so kindly, if I could just retract it and take it off the table, so be it. Uh, okay, you want to pull the motion off the floor? Certainly, sir. Council should agree to that. Bother. Retroactive for 20 minutes? <laughs> yeah. Does it need a All seconder? Right. <laughs> the motion uh, has been proposed to be taken off the floor by the mover. Ms. Cheryl, is that? Yes, yes, sir. Is that, I can is second that council's it. wish? Councilor Nickel. Well, is that okay with the seconder? Right, the seconder has to agree. Who was the seconder? Councillor Windsor, Whitman. Councillor Whitman was a seconder. Yep, I'll support uh, Councillor Hensby as always. Thank you. Okay, so folks, that motion is off the floor then. Retracted. That, are we are we legal here, Cheryl and John? Am I? Yes. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. 
All right. That was good. Um, 8.2.3, Councillor Austin, uh, HRM, Halifax, Port Authority, Fish, Fish, Pas Fish Passage. Councillor Austin. Councillor Austin. Are you on mute, Councillor Austin? Okay, uh, try that again. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council request that the CEO and staff engage with the Halifax Port Authority on the potential use of offsetting funds to enable fish passage from Sullivan's Pond to Lake Minook, and that the CEO report back to Council with the results of that engagement to identify the potential for a joint project. Seconded, Seconded by. by Lisa. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so this is something that's been in the works for a little while. The Port Authority has been uh, working on this with a consultant. Basically, when they expanded the container terminal down at, uh, by Point Pleasant, um, they did damage to, they're doing damage to the harbor bottom. And as part of the DFO's regulations, they have to um, offset that damage by creating new fish habitat elsewhere. And uh, they could just dump a bunch of reef balls in the harbor and call it a day, but um, the conversations with DFO and the Port Authority have been leading towards doing something uh, much more innovative, um, linking up our watershed here. And so they've been, there's been a consultant engaged, there's work been going on on this. Um, it, for us, it's a, a, a wonderful opportunity because um, the, when we finish the Sawmill River project, we will enable fish to swim from the harbor on up to Sullivan's Pond, but they won't be able to get into Lake Binoak, Lake McMack, um, up into Frenchman's Brook, any of the connected watershed because we've got the culverts and the lock at Lake Binoak in the way. And we own those culverts, the lock is ours, uh, we control the water level in Lake Binoak, and the Finley Park where a fish ladder will likely go is also our parkland. So, you know, in terms of responsibility, you know, there's municipal assets all over this. And so what we have in front of us is basically an opportunity to take Port Authority money that they have to pay to offset the habitat loss and use that to make this connection. So it's potentially a huge win-win for everyone. Um, and we're at the point now where we just need the stamp of council priority on this so that we can actually have our team really fully engage in it. Because up until this point, it's been basically it's been worked on on the atrium side off the side of uh, someone's desk. And so we now need that uh, bigger level of commitment, which is why I brought the motion here today. So I hope colleagues that you'll support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Austin, for bringing this uh, motion forward. Uh, I, I remember the dialogue when we first talked about daylighting the Sawmill River and how much concern that was or how costly it might be, but also the fishways and the opportunity to increase the habitat in the area is even, even uh, more of a beneficial than just daylighting the stream itself. But my concern, though, is um, you know what dialogue is Halifax Water going to have in this because the concern is talk about the Port Authority and the municipality, but the Halifax Water is managing the stormwater systems. So there has to be some dialogue and discussion with them on their budget process, if not just a term budget. And also I've been advocating for some similar type of fishway a habitat um, migration path for Little Sam River, uh, where we put the new dam in at Lake Major, we put a fish ladder in, but the problem is that how much water goes through the fish ladder or over the dam also will have an, an impact of what kind of fish migration uh, path there is downstream. And I've been saying sometimes the, the riverbed dries up so much, there is no opportunity for the fish to get up. So I think that if we're looking at that for, for the uh, Sawmill River, I think we should be looking at some of our watershed uh, uh, areas where the water falls from, the, the, from our dams. We should also try to make sure there's a way, a safe way for fish to get back and forth from the sea to the, to the, to the spawning waters and the headland, headwaters. So uh, I think this is an admirable move, but I'd like to th see it uh, also apply elsewhere. Thank you. Councillor Archer, did you wish to speak to that? Yeah, yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <laughs> am I on mute here? No. Um, I, 
just just quickly to that, um, you know, Councilor Hensby's point about Halifax Waters, uh, a very good one. In this particular instance, though, Halifax Waters' responsibility is with the Sawmill River project. Uh, the culverts at Hawthorne are owned by HRM. They're not Halifax Water. The lock at uh, Lake Binook is HRM. Finley Park is HRM. The only thing Halifax Water actually has involvement in this one it will for is uh, they control the water levels in Lake Binook for us. Um, otherwise, this is a through and through uh, Halifax Regional Municipality responsibility, not a Halifax water one. So uh, it's wonderful to potentially have this opportunity to get something built that doesn't that's not going to be uh, on the taxpayer dime that's going to potentially be from this offsetting fund. Thank you. OK, but the further question I asked in regards to the jurisdictions of waterways, we have this discussion about weed management in regards to vegetation management in the lakes. This is also a fish habitat area. Is it DFO? Is it also the province's responsibility as well here? So are they going to be coming on board as possible funding partners as well? Because we don't control the waterways. We may control the flow a bit, but the actual jurisdiction may be more provincial or federal than its municipal mandate. So it's sort of curious of will we be uh, tapping on their doors as well for participation? So this is one of the things that uh, in the staff uh, conversations I've had, um, it's one of these kind of sticky pieces to this whole thing about, well, where is this jurisdiction? Where is this responsibility? Um, so that's something that I think would be covered off well in the uh, report that we'll eventually get back. Okay. Well, we hope so. Thank you. Seeing nobody else on the list, we'll call for the question. Question? Question. We're going to begin voting. Councillor Stretch. Voting for the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Kirsten. For the motion. <clears throat> Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Clary. Yay. Councillor Walker. For. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. In favor of the motion. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhead. Yes. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. 17 in favor. That's carried. Thank you. We'll move to 824, which is also Councillor Austin. Sidewalk patio placement, uh, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council request a staff report on amending the design criteria in the sidewalk patio administrative order to eliminate the requirement for sidewalk patios to be contiguous with the applying business. Thank you. Second by? Seconded by Whitman. Councilor Nickel. Seconded by Councilor Whitman, I heard. Um, if I might jump in for a second, Tony, you're sharing your screen. Somebody's screen is on our. There. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor uh, Austin. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so this is one that um, it uh, predates COVID, um, but of course our agenda got uh, sidelined. Um, it comes out of um, situation on Portland Street in downtown Dartmouth. That's uh, there's been actually three businesses that have sought to have sidewalk patios, but um, the the layout of Portland has uh, basically sidewalk and then that area that you would normally jut a uh, temporary sidewalk into is not always available because there's planters, there's other street furniture in there as part of the street uh, scaping program that was put in back in, I think it was 2008. And uh, if you juggle things around, if instead you had sidewalk and then patio, um, so that the patios could fit in between planters and not have to be right attached to the business and where you'd have servers cutting across that open space, suddenly you'd open up a whole lot more potential for some of these businesses that currently can't open patios to be able to do so. Um, and I've actually, I, I had a good conversation with Alcohol and Gaming. I mean, they're, I mean, they're, they're not giving guarantees, but they expressed a willingness to look at some more innovative solutions 
um, if we were willing to take a look at our design criteria, because it's actually us, not the liquor law that prohibits doing this. Um, so all I'm asking is the staff report to look at this potential because um, you know it adds a whole lot to the street life. And for anyone that's traveled, if you go around the world, you'll find this sort of set up all the time. In many European cities, it's absolute standard that you'll be walking down the sidewalk and then the cafe patios are on these little islands just on the other side of that open sidewalk. And so the and servers cross back and forth and the world goes on spinning just fine. And I think the same would be true of us. So uh, a more flexible criteria would certainly open up more possibilities for small business and enliven our streetscape. So uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to come up with something here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cleary on this one. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, I, I fully support this. Um, there are many instances uh, for anyone who's ever traveled to uh, other places, especially if you go to uh, Europe um, or even Toronto or Montreal or, or New York, um, the experience of being able to walk down a patio and have, or walk down the sidewalk and have a patio on one side and all the storefronts on the other side um, is great. And when Councillor Austin brought this forward, I actually had a conversation with him because I didn't, I, I mistakenly, and I bet you a lot of people do, think that most of the problems we have are the provincial uh, government's problems, not ours. Uh, but this is one that uh, apparently we could work with them and, and do. And I think it's well worthwhile not only to help uh, the businesses who might have uh, very restricted space directly in front of their business, but um, to actually improve the street life of the city. So I fully support this. Thank you, Councillor Austin, for bringing forward. Thank you. Anybody else? Perhaps we'll go to the question. 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 In favor of the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. In favor. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. Four. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Clary. Yay. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Four. Councillor Sarowski. Councillor Sarowski. In favor of the motion. Councillor Whitman. In favor. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. I'm voting yes for the motion. Thank you. Councillor Russell. Against the motion. Councillor Outhit. Yes. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. 16 1. 16 to 1. The motion passes. Thank you, Councillor Austin. 8.25, Councillor Whitman, letter of support for HRM staff. Councillor Whitman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage. My, I move that Halifax Regional Council acknowledge our support for all HRM staff and thank them for their unwavering service in these difficult times. Second, uh, seconded by Councillor Adams. Thank, thank you for the second, Councillor Adams. And uh, I look forward to unanimous support uh, on the public record to show our appreciation of the dedicated and diligent work our staff have done and continue to do in these very trying and challenging times. This motion is an opportunity for all members of council in an open forum to demonstrate our support. They certainly deserve it. Call for the question. Um, I've got a Councillor Cleary on this. Um, actually, I question believe was called, Mr. Mayor. once, yeah, once under our rules, Administrative Order 1, once the question is called, it has to be voted on and is non-debatable. Question? Begin voting. Was the motion seconded? I didn't hear a seconder. Yes, Councillor Adams. Adams. Somebody is showing their screen again. Uh, Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. 
Yay. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Clary. Yay. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For. Councillor Whitman. Definitely. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhit. Yes. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. That motion carries, Cheryl. Yes, it does. 17 and Thank you, eight. colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mr. Mayor, colleagues, could I, could I ask a quick Councilor, question? Councillor Carson? Yes, sorry, just a point of clarification that motion's passed. I'm just uh, uncertain in terms of the wording of the motion. Uh, is the intent, because it is a letter of support, is the intent for you to write a letter, Mr. Mayor? Because it's not in the motion. <clears throat> All the motion says it is acknowledged support and I'm not sure how that is done. Mr. Mayor, in the, in the usual course of things, you would write a letter uh, from Halifax Regional Council to, to that end. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Carson, you good with that? Yeah, it, 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 I'm perfectly fine with that, Mr. Mayor. Just not in the motion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, colleagues, we have a couple of in-camera uh, items which um, well, if anybody has an appetite to look at taking anything out, if not, we'll have to take a look at a motion to go in camera. What is your wish? Well, Mr. Mayor, since it deals with matters in my particular district, I think we should have a discussion in camera, please. Well, somebody move to go in camera. Paul Russell, I move to go in camera. Second by Council Walker. Seconded by Council Walker. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, we'll go in cam. We'll go in. Now, just a second, colleagues. I'm gonna, what time are we at here? 4.40. Okay. At 5 o'clock, uh, uh, we all turn into pumpkins and the thing starts all over again, right? So we'll see how quickly we can do this because uh, we have to move to a different room at 5 o'clock, correct? Correct. So do we, we'll go in camera and see where we are at the end of that. I'm so I would advice. suggest, I would suggest, Mayor, but Phil, you can... Uh, confirm this that when we come back from in camera we come into the, our new meeting that's right uh yes yes we would cheryl yep okay thank thank you phil so we will come into there's a second meeting in your calendar and we when we come back from in camera we'll come in okay. to but that we adjourn meeting. from here and we go to a different room anyway right we recess we recess right. and come back in a different room though we have to sign Correct. out of this one and go into the right. in-camera. So colleagues, there's a number of things in your calendar. Make sure you sign into the one for in-camera. We'll go so, in camera. Sure? Yep. We'll go in but, camera. Mr. Mayor, it's Bill, uh, Councillor Carson. Just clarification, we do hang up from this meeting, right? 